Well, hello again, everyone. This is Bob Mannery, and you're listening to Tom and Mike AM in the PM only on A2D Radio. Tom and Mike, these guys are fucking awesome. But their side piece, Greg, that guy is a goddamn problem. Welcome, 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 Tom. Mike. Hey, uh, in the PM. A2DRadio.com, live from the BMW of Atlantic City Studios. BMW of Atlantic City. Roll back to 17 in the Parkway. Find them online, BMW of Atlantic City.com. Every Wednesday night, brought to you by our certified public accountant. Make them yours, Gibson Mayor LLC. Find them on the web, GibsonMayor.com. Tom Renone, Michael Mataraki, Jeff Singer. Where's Greg at? Where's Greg at? Greg's Don't- on the wrong side. Duncan is puppies in the Pacific. Rob Hovey on the ones and twos. So, let's introduce our guest. We How don't have doing? many guests. We usually have Greg. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, it feels good to have a guest. Jeff Singer, Philadelphia Phillies. Fighting Redding Phillies, if you're looking for them on the book. That's where you got to find the Redding Phillies. It was tough to find the tag for the fighting Red, for the fighting Phillies. I don't know. I'm, uh, think, I'm thinking he may be with the Iron Pigs this year, moving on up like uh, like the Jeffersons up in here. Good to have <laughs> you, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Definitely appreciate it. Enjoying being here, so this is awesome. Really enjoying it. You guys can ask Jeff whatever questions you want. How much money does he make? All that kind of stuff. All the stuff we talked about <laughs> pre-show. Look, just don't do anything that gets him released. Yeah. Keep, the, keep the questions it's clean. Keep them minimum. Keep them cl- minimum. Keep them clean, and we'll roll them through. Listen, we're running through a lot. Sixers continue to struggle. We'll talk Phil's winter, winter, ah, winter meetings as we move on later in the show. And we're just going to bounce back and forth. We're going to go Eagles, Phil's, Eagles, Phil's, Eagles, Phil's. And listen, if you like the Eagles and you don't like the Phil's, I don't know what to tell you. You got at least that 500 here to be a part of the show tonight. That's it. We're not asking you, you got to be a Sixers or Flyers guy, but you got to at least be an Eagles and Phil's guy and deal with that tonight. Two for four every night, baby. Line right in our poll question, brought to you by Scanzano Sports. Find them on the web, scanzanosports.com. Which member of the Eagles secondary was most to blame? for the Birds' defensive woes on Sunday. And there's one guy not in here, but it's Malcolm Jenkins, Darby, Patrick Robinson, Rodney McLeod, and you can put Jalen Mills in there if you want to, or you can just put Ronald Darby's tweets in there I, any way I you want to go about that. I didn't think Jalen Mills played that badly. I didn't think he played that bad either. So let us know. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, is where you can find us. We'll be mm. answering all your questions all night long, and we'll stay with tons of Eagles. So, Mike, right into it. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm coming out hot. Well, come in hot. Cause, cause you it, heard what I had to say yesterday about it. I, so. I, I didn't, but I did, I, I did that on purpose, and you know I did that on purpose. The Malcolm Jenkins stuff, I'm totally on board with. Well, I'm going to rip Charles and I tell. Uh, and, and, he and, tells people they don't watch tape. Uh, he don't know I got all 32. <laughs> How does he know what I do in my, in my spare time in my bedroom? <laughs> you know what I mean? He doesn't know what I do. Look, here's you the You know deal. my search engines? My, the answer, the answer, my answer to the poll question is Ronald Darby, and I don't give a shit that he had an interception on Sunday. When you got guys named Tavares King and Sterling Shepard and Tony Baloney running 10 yards up the field on you, cutting into the inside and letting Eli light you up for over 400 yards passing, and you're supposed to be a goddamn number one corner in this league on a team that's 12-2, and two, that you're the problem. You are the problem. Bottom line. And if, if he wants to come out on Twitter – and talk about, what, what did he say, halfway fans that want to criticize a bad game and, and that the media shouldn't be talking about him? Ron, you played six goddamn games in this city. You've played 35 games in your NFL career. You have four interceptions in your entire NFL career. So we, and we have a job to do. I think you said that as well, that, that we have a job to do. So halfway fans and media, okay, well, what about me? I was a 20-year season ticket holder, but, I, but we have a job to do. So uh, am I, as a 20-year season ticket holder, just supposed to ignore that you played like shit on Sunday and not say a word because I'm also a member of the media and I have to go to work on Wednesday night? No, get the fuck out of here, dude. 
For real. It, it's real simple. I, I said it. Like, we don't. I, I hate to use an adage, we pay your salary, because I hate that. That's not an excuse no, to, to crucify or yeah. crush guys, but you're allowed to have an opinion because we're human beings too, and we're watching a football game, and we're going to get jacked up, and we're Eagles fans. We live and die play by play. It's not even game by game. It's play by play. If, you, if you're on social media during an Eagles game, it's a play by play business, right? It's not, it's, it's what have you done for me lately in that last play? In that so last series. Your, your $100 million Fletcher Cox can get double teamed and blown up, and, and he'll get crushed, <laughs> right? I mean, Carson <laughs> throws a bad ball, and, and he gets crushed. You know what I mean? So, you know, Doug doesn't run the ball every, you know, on a play where in Madden, where the coach of Justin tells you to run it, he's throwing, and people get all up in arms. So, I, that's just part of the game. That's part of big market talk. And I said in the video, welcome to Philly, Daddy. This yeah, isn't Buffalo. You're not in Buffalo this anymore. Is real, this is real. I'm not saying Buffalo fans aren't real, but it's a major market. And there's more media outlets. There's more, there's more of a fan base than you do have in Buffalo. And guess what? Because people went to Twitter, maybe some dumb fans, and maybe not some dumb fans. It's how you go about it. Like, are people attacking a guy personally for having a bad game? I'm not buying into that one. Right. But if you're, if you're getting on it because, hey, you had a bad first half. That's just facts. Look, That's here's, just facts. Here's the thing. We, we talk all but the time. It's, but it's bigger, it's bigger than Ronald Darby. Oh, it is. And but, that's going to tie in, though, we'll, a lot to We're going to come bigger to bigger than Darby. It is. It's bigger than Ron. It's bigger it's, than it's Ron. It's way bigger than this Ron. It's not Jim Schwartz and the Malcolm Jenkins situation. But right, that's me, what I was going to come let, in with, me, with let, the Malcolm Jenkins. Yeah. When you guys, like, they're bringing him up in the box. That's what we were talking about the other day. They're bringing him up, and I feel that's kind of hurting our corners because the corners don't have any backup now yeah. back in the safety area. That's the one thing. that We were actually talking about that the other day. I feel bringing Malcolm Jenkins up is actually kind of hurting us. No, but, you're absolutely yeah. right. Let me, let me get no, this. No, it is yeah. because now you're, you're, you're hurting. So, okay, I get it. Like Charles was saying Jordan Hicks being out, and, and that's tough. And, you know, you don't have another linebacker. Joe Walker's hurt. So now Najee Good's in there, and they just, I guess they don't trust him enough on every down. So now they move Malcolm up into the box. But now you're hurting two positions for the sake of one. And I thought we – Jim learned this lesson last year when, when we were down corners and Malcolm went and played up into the slot more, and he's not a one-on-one guy against wideouts in this league. He can't. Yeah. Now, tight ends, sure. Running backs, yeah, he does a good job against, but he's a Pro Bowl safety. He got right. voted to the Pro Bowl today as a safety. He didn't get voted as a corner. As a nickel guy, he got voted as a safety. <laughs> well, he's definitely he's definitely not a Pro Bowl. Quarter. Unless I miss something, but now let me let, go me, ahead. let me just finish this Ron Darby thought real quick, and then we'll definitely swing this back around there. And we're talking Phil still. Yeah, I mean, we're and, talking Phil. We're talking Phil still. <laughs> this thing that, that's bothering me with Ron Darby's, you know, like we talk about the Bills Mafia all the time. Yeah, and, and the Bills they're animals. Like, I, love them. I love them. I love them. They are. They're, they're animals. Awesome. They're animals. And I want to be one just like one weekend. Can I just jump off of one of the table? But here's when you on fire when you play in Philadelphia. You are playing for the most passionate fan base in the NFL. And if you're going to have rabbit ears over some stuff that's being posted on Twitter about you after you've played six games in this city, six, not even a full season because you were injured. Six. Six. And, oh, by the way, Ron, when you were injured, was there anybody talking about, oh, this guy's a bust, he's constantly hurt, you know, why did people we, would why leave did their we wives this for him through yeah. that stretch of being out? It was like people were like, you know, hurry back. We miss you. We need yeah. you. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll come for, to dinner. I'll what donate I? my ankle to you. I mean, Anything. like, so, I mean, this guy just, I mean, bottom line, STFU and, and play some football because we got five games left. I'm throwing it out there right now. We got five games left and we're going to need you. Now, to your point, Malcolm Jenkins, Jim Schwartz. Oh, I watched that video three, four, five times because because we were there. When you when you come out hot right out of the gate and say I'm not keeping this to one minute, I'm in, I'm in, and I and and I told you, man, testify because it's it's spot on. Yeah, and I mean, usually I, mean, I keep things to you know for Instagram purposes. I right. keep things to a minute. And I thought this was bigger than a minute. I thought the Malcolm Jenkins talk was bigger than a one minute video to get into the issue of bringing is, him up into the box. But to me, this is a problem because it's this year, but it was also last year with Schwartz, but it was also with the previous regime oh, uh, with Chip Kelly and Billy Davis. Oh, Billy and, Davis. That, that, you know, that's those guys, like, yeah. like, how many times do we have to see this act before we know how it ends? And I understand it's a different coaching staff and it's their second year, but, I mean, if you guys could, could be – in a baseball facility talking about this and knowing how tactically wrong it is. How can an NFL coaching staff not figure it out? And that was part of the video. I can sit on my couch and tell you that's not a good idea. 
And I can sit there and tell you, the Saints told you X amount of years ago when they drafted him, they tried playing him at corner. He was exposed game in, game out. And they said, oh, this isn't going to work. So they moved him back to safety. Next thing you know, guy's a Pro Bowl safety. Like that. Like that because he's great at reading quarterbacks. He's great at playing in a, conv- a confined space, I should say, more than he is left out on an island one-on-one. And then Corey Graham is now your safety. There's a reason that. Corey, Corey Graham stinks. If Eli threw a good ball on Sunday, that ball's <laughs> caught. If Eli threw a good ball, that ball's caught. I mean, right, it's that simple. Corey Graham's yeah. a guy, and people are already chiming in. Rasul Douglas. Why is Rasul Douglas not, not suiting up? Why was Rasul Douglas not on the field at all Sunday? All of a sudden, the guy all he does, does is make plays. He finds the football. I mean, what has he done that egregious that he doesn't even get a suit up on Sunday and a guy like Corey Graham can't? Is because Corey Graham's a veteran? Well, I mean, yeah, the, the answer Always going to go with the younger guy. And that, it, as a, as as well, a retread guy, I always go with the younger. As well you should. But we know what this Eagles staff does, Eagles coaching staff does with, with veteran guys. I mean, they, they bring Brian Brayman in to, to shore up the special teams. And four days after he signs, he's on the field. And at the cost of Russell Douglas. Now, this week, if it's a situation where Patrick Robinson can't go, damn sure better better bet that Russell's in there. But I'm not giving him, or I'm not giving Corey Graham the playing time over over Douglas. I mean, Douglas no. Douglas just has to jump into Put that Douglas spot. Douglas in the slot, leave Malcolm where he is. Right. Real simple. Get exactly. to some of these uh, comments on Facebook real quick. Uh, Greg. Didn't watch the game, so I can't answer the poll question. But I do love the Santana signing. So right in the, there, we go right, right into in the, the Santana. Fills. I mean, you, you gotta love this signing. I mean, any, we, we I think we talked about it, and I talked to Last you about week, it. Yeah. I talked to Jeff about it. You know, it just in that deal of moving Galvis and bringing in Santana, your on base percentage in your lineup just went up like 80 80 percent. Well, it's funny I mean, it's because a ridiculous I... number, which is a lot. And if you're Kapler and you're an analytic guy and you're Matt Clintock and you're Building that, putting that, so much analytic stock into what you're building here, that's that's something you got to do. And you're bringing in a professional hitter. And he said it today. Capper said, "Listen, you know, what we think a Dubal Herrera or, or Hoskins is going to be upset that we signed mm-hmm. Santana? No, they're not upset. They they realize that this guy's good for our ball club. This guy's going to help us win games. They're not going to be upset. See the hug. One, see the hug play the, the end, outfield, the <laughs> and they even said Santana might even play the outfield yeah. too. So you know." Hoskins will still get time at first base, and they won't, like, officials say, hey, you're just an outfielder. And it's something that, you know, analytic-wise, they, they can tell us well, I mean, game in, game out, how they're going to go about that it one. It was interesting, though, because we sat here last week and, and, you know, Wednesday night, and I said to you and Greg, you know, give me your thoughts, Carlos Santana. And you guys were both pretty much spot on with, you know, professional hitter, power, on-base percentage. Literally the next day it gets done. But did, did you see the hug today at the end? Him and Kapler in the in the shake hands with the hug, and then shake hands and the hug again in the long embrace, and the whole time Santana's like chirping in his ear. So, Jeff, what what do you say to a manager in that situation? I mean, I, are you thanking him for signing you? Or? You're thanking him, but also I think he's just telling him how excited he is for this year. Like I'm excited, like where I'll be, but I'm definitely excited to see what the big league ball club's doing. Um. Got a lot of young talent, and we got a lot of good guys on that or in the organization and on that team. So I'm just really excited to see what everyone's just going to be doing. And with the analytics thing, I think it's great. You know, our on-base percentage will definitely go up with all the tools we have now. And just – it's just even – we'll have a good defense now. We got room for J.P. Crawford coming in at shortstop, and he's got an amazing glove. I always enjoyed watching him play this year. And just all the people we have coming up in our organization, I feel we got big-name guys that are just going to start coming in and just – Stepping up to the table and being able to help out the big league. Well, ball your club. boy, you know, your boy Kingery. Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's his boy. Yeah. We all love. Yeah, I got that's to, like, actually, I was, was going <laughs> to ask you. I had to say like, that. I had to of, go into Kingery. Of, of all the guys that you've actually played with, at, you know, same team, same time. Yeah. Who do you think is closest at this point? I think Kingery. Is it? Um, just like watching him play. You know, when I was in there, I was an instructor with him before he left for Arizona, and just he's just someone that you want the ball hit to him. Like, especially when you're pitching, you want the ball hit to him. Every time I'm on the mound, you know, I know where I'm throwing the ball, and I just know if it's a ground ball that way, I just start walking because I know he's going to make the play for me. And having him up the bat, you know, he's going to – at worst, he's going to have a good at bat for you. And you know he'll he, – he has the power to put the ball out of the, uh, out of the stadium for you, and he has the power to hit the ball in the gap, and then he has the speed to get you stretching singles and doubles, stretching doubles and the triples. And 
I just really enjoyed watching him play, whether I was in the dugout, whether I was on the mound, whether I was in the bullpen. It was just awesome watching him play. All right, Trade Hernandez tomorrow. I mean, I'm done. I'm done. And I got I, him. And I'm an Hernandez I got him. guy. And I, I finally and got I, him. I, I, well, I mean, it, it takes Sigurd to come in, but well, I got yeah, you. Well, he's, I got been, well, he's been selling on me <laughs> for a while. Hernandez is a great guy. You know, he was down when he was uh, rehabbing. He was down with us in Clearwater, and uh, he I got to see him play too. And he's another guy. You know, it's. When you get as far as to A ball to double A, and I don't know about the triple A or big leagues, but I know they're there. They're going to make the plays for you. You know, you rarely see someone mess up like that. You know, guys are behind you when you're pitching. They're going to make the plays for you. And I'm just enjoying the moment. And I really am just really lucky to be in the organization and really where I am right now. I'm just enjoying it. Well, isn't it bigger for, for you, though, too? I mean, it's cool. Growing because, up, you know, as I grew up a Phillies, Phillies fan. fan. Um, I was at a few games in 08, and that was just amazing. So Jeff, definitely just being able to say I'm actually a part of this organization now, it's just really awesome. Well, let, is let, it surreal? Like the let, first, let, that's, let, that's, let, the, that's the last question I got. I mean, well, is it surreal, though? I mean, actually, oh, it's amazing. It, like you guys when you first got signed by I the Phillies. Well, that's yeah. what I was going to say. Let's tell the people like how you got here, though. I mean, so when you came out of high school, did you sign out of high school or did you go to college? I went to college. Um, I actually went to a junior college. Uh, I went to Gloucester County College. I was okay. there for two years. Ended up signing the Monmouth University, and, you know, I enjoyed Monmouth. Uh, players were great. Coaches were great. Just felt like that area and that place wasn't really for me, even though I ended up there back at Lakewood, which is kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> So I ended up leaving uh, Monmouth University. I went to Rutgers Cannon for my senior year of baseball where I was with uh, Coach Dennis Barth, who he was a big-name guy with Brooklawn Baseball. They won numerous amount of Legion World Series, and I knew if that, was, that place was the place for me to go. I knew I was going to be around a great group of guys, and – you know, I wasn't drafted, which, uh, you know, that didn't really sit well with me. I was sitting there on draft day just waiting to hear my name called. And after round 40, you know, I was just like, all right, well, I think that's it. It's over with. So I actually was playing in the Rancocas Valley League with all my friends and some older guys that I knew and played in that league after my uh, senior year of high school. So, you know, I'm back there just enjoying it. And I'm working over at uh, the car dealership, Dumphy Ford, where I've been working since I was 15 around just washing cars and just – Kind of grinding it out, just got to get my college degree now and just get back in reality. And uh, luckily, luckily, um, I had an advisor who's now my agent, Jim Ulrich, uh, kept with me and just said, hey, keep throwing. Something's going to happen. You don't know. Just keep throwing. It's baseball. Anything can happen. And uh, the Camden River Sharks ended up giving me a call, and they had about a month and a half, two months left of their season. So – they get, my, well, of their existence. Of their existence, not <laughs> but, even the season. But of their please, whole, God, please Of go the ahead. whole existence of the River Sharks. So uh, they gave me a call, and I kind of knew what I was getting myself into when I uh, went there for my first weekend. We were going to Southern Maryland, and I'm with guys that I knew were – most of them, I think I was probably the only one at the time. I think there was like me and three other guys were the only ones that never been in affiliate baseball. And we have guys like uh, Steve Garrison who played in the bigs with the Yankees. We got guys – like Bill Murphy, who was in the big leagues with the Dodgers. So I'm surrounded by some ex-big leaguers. So I was kind of starstruck, which was pretty cool. And I knew my role was going to be a mop-up guy. I knew I was going to be there just basically eat up innings, save everyone's arms. And I did that. And I pitched pretty well. And I'm working with Ryan Kulik, who he actually got hurt. And now he's the uh, pitching coach for Rowan University. So And he's a, also a South Jersey guy. So he kind of took me under his wing. And I was working with Ryan Kulik. He's showing me some mechanical stuff, moved me on the other side of the rubber, and helped me um, just feel more comfortable pitching against older guys. My first game with the River Sharks, I'm pitching against Freddie Lewis, who has a ring with the Giants. Right. Um, my last game with the River Sharks, I pitched against Rafael Palmero. Wow. So <laughs> that was wild. Um, so Did I was. Just, nah, I didn't. I actually walked on me, hit a ball in the gap, and I think he pulled his quad right in the yeah, second sure. base. At that point, I'm sure but, he did. Uh, yeah. And then, um, wait, that's left on left. You got to go three yackers and get him out of there. I was, uh, I was, that was a struggle for me. I was, <laughs> I definitely would have pitched him differently if it was uh, now. But, um, you know, after the River Sharks, I threw pretty well for them. And after the River Sharks, I got invited to a workout where it was me and probably like, I don't know, like 60 other kids. And I was actually the only, it was me and another kid were the only two lefty pitchers there. And it was at some, not even a nice, like, park in uh bridgeport connecticut i remember me and my dad drove up the day before just to like get a good hotel room but it was the yankees red sox and orioles were there first time i ever hit 95 was there the yankees got really interested gave me talked to a few scouts there uh talking about coming up to yankee stadium to throw a bullpen so i'm just really excited just like i'm not knowing what's really going on and as this is going on um phillies uh my agent's been talking to a philly scout roland george who ends up signing me and 
basically he knows that the Yankees are about to give me a contract, so the Phillies give me a contract. So I uh, was lucky enough to get a contract with the Phillies. I actually signed on my grandfather's birthday, which wow. was awesome. So no, October that, 15th. That's tremendous. So I was just really lucky to be in that position, and I just really enjoyed it. And then basically all they gave me, they gave me a plane ticket to Florida and said, do what you can and see where it goes from there. And got my plane ticket, went to spring training, and uh, didn't make a team, but I didn't get released. And that was my main goal, just make it through spring training and just see what happens after that. And then I went to extended spring training, and then I just kept on moving up and finished up in double-A this year. And I'm really excited to see where next year takes me. I'm just Bob, trying to stay positive. Bob Harmon's got a good, great question. Go, go ahead. Here. Uh, he wants to know, how much does Redding deal with analytics – and how much are coaches, like, talking to you about analytics in terms of, like, scouting reports and stuff like that? Any, any, any of that? It's a good question. It was really, you know, the beginning of Clintac, right, you know, last two years ago. So, building that in, I guess, Well, let me, let, me, let me tack something onto that as we go, go to Jack. Away. Because I, I did a little homework this afternoon. And, <laughs> and we'll, I'll ask how you respond to this while, with that question. So, if someone says to you, Undersized left-hander, late bloomer, hits mid-90s, don't know where this came from. How do you respond to that within the whole analytics thing? Because this is, this is what I read about you today. No, I understand. Late, um, late bloomer. I got, a lot of, I got a lot of people ask me questions like, what would you do? Like, how would you get the jump in velocity? And honestly, it was just I think it's from me maturing and being surrounding myself around the right people. Right. I surrounded myself with the right people. I got the right – um, mentors, coordinators, coaches, and I owe a lot of that even to my high school coaches all the way to now. And I think just doing different stuff to my mechanics. And if you look at guys, you look at me, and you can even look at guys like Tim Linscomb. He wasn't a big guy, but his mechanics were so good that he was able to get that velocity jump. And with me, I'm focused on leading with the hip, getting my shoulders tilt back, kind of like um, how most of our pitchers now in the Phillies organization, that's big on our uh, mechanics. And you'll see some of our guys in our organization, Sixto Sanchez, he's throwing 102. He's about my size, maybe a little <laughs> shorter. Like, he's not that big of a kid either, but he's throwing 102, and that's because of his mechanics and his hard work. And that's how I feel about it. I really worked hard for this. And I am I know I'm lucky, but I'm also confident in what I can do, and I'm really excited about it. So when, when you hear something like that, when it comes back as late bloomer, undersized, I you love know, it. Now, I love that Now song. throwing in the mid-90s, yeah. don't know where the velocity came from. Like, you're you're cool with that. Like, is, yeah, is that, is know, that like your yeah. motivating factor I now? I wouldn't or? say it's my motivating factor. I just love hearing that stuff, you know. Um, just being even a guy from, like, the Jersey area, the Northeast area, like, yeah, we have Mike Trout, and he's obviously one of the greatest players to play, continue play. But you don't see many Northeast guys really getting picked up, even the big D1 school. So, right, right there, I, like, kind of take that as something, like, I'm a New Jersey guy, and I'm lucky to be with my hometown team right now. And right. I look at it as in more in that aspect more than just like I can listen to what these people are saying, but you know what? I'm going to focus on what I have to do. Nice. I like it. So then back to tie, what, tying, that yeah. in, tying that into the analytics. The old analytics thing. thing like you, we work on everything. Um, with my situation, I'm a lefty, and I could be a lefty-lefty matchup guy. You know, it's whatever is good for my career and whatever's going to help the Phillies win. And I'm just going to – basically, I'm there to do what they tell me. I'm going to do whatever I can to get on the field as quick as possible. And with me, I knew I was going to come in – coming in the seventh, maybe eighth, maybe ninth inning. But I knew I was going to be there to get lefties out and more get – and that's what the thing I really enjoyed was being in double A is I got put in those situations no matter what the situation was. Like, yeah, you want to go and win games, but we all know the minor leagues is – it's building a farm system to get to the big leagues and make the best big league team possible. And – with what we do with our players, I really enjoy. And I just enjoy watching with other guys. Like, we're all competing for the same position. We're all competing to make it and be better than each other. But we're all be on each other's backs, too. Right. We have each other's backs. They're my teammates. I love the guys to death. So, they put us in those situations to get used to it. In the analytics way, like, we need a guy to put a bunt down. We need a guy just to get on base. We need a guy just to hit the guy over. We need a guy to come in and just get that one hitter, throw four pitches, and you're out so you can pitch tomorrow and the next day. So, I mean – we, we used to talk about it a lot last year, like early in the season, like once, you know, once you got to Clearwater and all of a sudden like the saves started piling up 
and we would watch it pretty frequently. I mean, we I'd be texting him like I'd be sending like because I get the the minor league like score updates like constantly. I'd be texting him screenshots of my phone, and be like, <laughs> "Your boy got another save. No, there, Sing no got there. another save." Like, no so we were watching it pretty closely. But as the saves started piling up, I mean, did you kind of get a feeling like you were getting pretty close to getting out of there, or was it just a matter of just go out and do your job yeah, every day and I see was, what happens? Yeah, like it gets to the point where you you're in the same pl- like area the same time. It kind of gets to the point where you're like, all right, when's my shot? Like, when's it gonna happen? But you, if you think like that, that's when it kind of starts crashing down on you. And that's what I actually learned. I would like call my dad and just be like, yo, like are you hearing anything what's going on and he just say yeah just stay positive and just keep doing what you're doing you're pitching great and just focus on yourself and I was that's what I was doing I was you know I was getting a lot of saves but I was also enjoying coming in those games when it was a tie ball game or we're down by one because everybody loves a comeback and you just want to enjoy the moment so you're just playing baseball and living yeah at the moment. I was I was just enjoying it you know um I'm living a dream that I really didn't think I was going to have three years ago so I'm just really lucky to be in the air, like situation I'm in now and whatever the Phillies feels best for my career and my situation, what's better for the organization I'm behind. Nice. 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 We so, got tons coming in. What do you got over there? I'm just – You back to – tons of eagles still over there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at this. I mean, 2016, 179 ERA in the minors this year, three. And that was obviously because you, you ran into a, a little bit of a rough patch at Reading. But, I, I mean – Clearwater five and two with a bunch of saves two three four, it's great stuff, man. No question about it. Yeah, three earned run average good anywhere in my yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> put it put it this way: if you could pitch be, between a stadium in Florida and Reading, and you come in combined three ERA, I think you're doing doing all right, man. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. I was really lucky this year. I had a great group of people behind me, and just was had a lot of fun too. Like I definitely enjoyed being down in Florida. You know, Clearwater's an awesome area. It's gorgeous down there. I never really got to go down there when I was younger. So to go down there and just being with the Phillies and have my family come and visit me and friends, it's just really, really great time. Yeah, and they get a vacation out of oh, it. Oh, yeah, it's, they get a vacation. Amazing. and Michael DeAndrew saying, right, if it, you guys never been to spring training for Clearwater, it, it's a beautiful it's place. you got to check it's it out. Great time. There, you know? <laughs> we were plotting to do a show from there last year, and it never <laughs> came to fruition. Well, it was always this year. I've never been, so I, I would love to do it. It's gorgeous down there. And then uh, – Spectrum Stadium's amazing. I love that field, and they got Frenchies there, and it's a, it's a gorgeous stadium. And definitely that bullpen, the way they had the bullpen set up, is like kind of both teams are together and everything. It's mm. great. Like if there's a like a brawl during the game, it's kind of awkward when we're running down <laughs> together, single file line. Yeah. But Why other not? than that, is there like an unwritten rule that you don't touch the other team until we you get to yeah, the infield? We, it, you know, you don't really know what's gonna happen. If there's bad blood, you don't know. But like it was funny because like you'd be running down, and it'll be like. Your team and other guys seem like it's just like single file line, and we're like, and then line you up, just stand guys. out and you just like kind of go the other way. So it's funny, but definitely enjoyable. But like you get to talk, like you see guys that you played with before, like when we were playing like the Tampa Yankees. I, the Yankees were on my team when I was in the fall league, so I knew most of those guys. So how's everyone doing? Like we're all doing the same thing. We're all right. trying to make it to the big leagues. It's not like we're trying to outdo each other. Just trying to maintain, and you don't know like. Ten years from now, you guys might be on the same team, or ten years from now, you might be in the same office just working together and be like, dude, remember that one time when we were just in Tampa playing each other or something like that? Just good talk. And, you know, being in the bullpen is really enjoyable. I really enjoy being in the bullpen. I was never really a bullpen guy until I made it to the uh, uh, minor league. So I was always a starter, so I always was in the dugout hanging with the hitters and stuff. And, you know, hitters and pitchers are entirely different people. And then being a lefty, even more different, so – so if they if they called you up tomorrow and said, "Get stretched out, we want to try you as a starter again this year," I'd be all for it. Like whatever's gonna whatever's gonna help the Phillies organization and whatever's gonna get me to the big leagues. But you know, do you, it en- seems do you like enjoy being a reliever? I love it. I, nice. It's so much fun. It's uh, get, I feel like you get to throw a lot more. I love pitching back to back days, and uh, it was always fun. Like being put in the pressure situation pressure situation than putting myself in the pressure situation like if that makes sense it uh, does it makes coming in sense. with a man on third you know it's fun to get that out and save your uh guy that's in front of you and instead of getting a guy on third and you get taken out and you're like <laughs> all right like and you know it's a team sport you got to rely on your teammates which i'm great like i'm surrounded by a great group of guys and i love all of them they're all great guys so cool. really lucky nice. real, qu- real quick fellas jeff i want to ask you Making that adjustment from starter to reliever, was that your biggest challenge so far, or what would be your biggest challenge? My, the biggest challenge from being a starter reliever was warming up for me. I, it was tough for me to 
know how many pitches I need to get loose to come in. Because if I'm only throwing one inning, I need to be throwing my hardest that one inning. When I was a starter, I always felt like I threw harder as the inning went as the game went on. So, and that was probably the hardest thing for me in the beginning. Uh, other than that, now nah, I was right. I got used to it because when I was at Rutgers, I was our starter. I would relieve some games and then I would close a game out here or there. So I got used to it that way. But when it comes to warming up, I felt like that was probably the hardest thing for me to get used to. Daniel Bakley, how do you feel about the new manager? Well, you know how that's going. You know how that answer is going to come back. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's no. great. It's definitely great. I'm really excited to see what this year goes. Um, big analytics guy, which I'm really supportive about, and yeah, I'm definitely really excited. Bob Harmon, Jeff, is he a four for four guy? Wants to know. Wants to know if you're a four for four guy. I am a four for four so guy. I, I, know, Bob. I even cheered for the Philly Kicks when I was younger. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Brodo, hey Jeff, welcome to the couch. Todd Womack, Philly Dilly guys. Like a casting <laughs> call right there. Like, yeah. welcome to the couch. Yeah. Hi, oh, I. You know what? I got a ton of Eagle stuff here. So yeah, I got one more. You got, you got more baseball. stuff. I got one let's, more fills, which is a good that. one. Uh, Frank Vespi, he's got a question for you. He knows minor leagues are full of crazy, wacky promotions. What's the weirdest one you've you've seen? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good question. <laughs> I wouldn't say it was like the craziest, but one of my really probably one of my best friends in the organization, Austin Bosar. He's a Penn grad. He's from St. Louis. He, uh, me and him were roommates in Clearwater, and I remember when I got moved up, I was just telling him, I'm like, I'll see you soon, and it's like a few weeks weeks later, he's like, yeah, I'm coming up, but I'll only be there for like three days, and he was right, he's like, he knew his job, and I just thought it was funny, like, it's tough going from Clearwater to Reading and then going right back, and just the way he, he's just one of those guys I loved having on my team, and his, his the way he, his journey in pro baseball is kind of close to the same as mine, didn't get a lot of money uh, in the signing bonus wise, but he's dragging he's grinding through it and he's a hard worker and I love pitching to him but his journey like just moving up moving down moving up moving down he's going back and forth and it's crazy we got guys that go from high a to triple a back to high a we got guys going from low a to double a back to low a I I was actually gonna ask you like left-handed relievers and catchers it's, have that thing in common yeah, where you you could get double or triple jumped it's, you go anywhere. based on where there's a need yeah, it's, on, on a weekend or something like you'll that. You'll go anywhere, and especially like being in like a minor league organization when it comes to pitching or catching, you got to be like a Swiss Army knife. you got to be able to go with any situation you can, and you just got to rise to the occasion and just figure out and know how you're going to come at this uh, moment in your life. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. So we got – we'll talk later on. We'll give Eagles, Raiders predictions, offense, defense, player to game as well. We'll talk about Phil's right. winter meetings, talk about some players that Phil's have been – names have been tied to. We'll get into that. There's some good names on that list. Uh, Pro Bowl snubs. Talk about Kelsey, Nigel, Jake Elliott not making it. And Nigel's interesting to me. So is Kelsey. They both had good years. And we'll talk about the guys who did make it, Nick Foles' performance, and we can go 13-2 and two this – Christmas Day mm. against the Oakland Raiders, or night, should I say, with a chance to go 13-2 and two and guarantee everything having to come through the city of Philadelphia, or a Vikings loss on Sunday, and it's a wrap. Actually, and Saturday. Saturday, they, they play, Saturday? They play Saturday. So, so we, Saturday, Sunday, Monday games? We, nice. Yeah, we, Nobody's I, mad about that. You don't got to twist my arm. Yeah, but we, no you, more college I mean, football, really. Yeah, but you, going you could go into Christmas night literally like, with Nate Sudfeld at quarterback because the game's meaningless. Well, that's too meaningless. Like, yeah, I think you still need to get him yeah, reps. Yeah, I, ag- I agree uh, I'm completely. a big believer in that. Like, continue to get him reps. I know he – listen, he did what I what I expected him to do against right. the Giants and who I think Nick Foles is, and he's a guy who knows the offense really well inside and out. I thought he knew it better than Carson just because he's been around it longer, which isn't a shot at Carson at all. And it's, hey, can you execute it? And we talked about, it, like, the biggest thing with backups is a lot of times that playbook gets cut right in half. And when that playbook gets cut in half, the offense gets cut in half. And now you're talking a team that would score 30 points is scoring 15 and they're struggling. And people are wondering, you know, what's going on here? But the thing with Nick also is he throws a deep ball well, too. So he's got zip on the ball. He's not your usual backup. So let me ask you guys real real quick, though. I mean, I I understand that the – They're Saturday night Vikings. The offense struggled at times on Sunday, but I don't put that on Nick at all. But have you guys ever seen a backup quarterback – and granted, the Giants aren't a dominating defense. But have either of you guys ever seen a backup quarterback in his first start of the season come out and look more comfortable no. than, than Nick did on Sunday? I don't think he's Sunday? a backup quarterback. Though. I, I, I feel like he can start either. for about six, like maybe six big, uh, teams right now for any other, uh, other football teams. And, and guess right what? Now. You know what happened? When, when he went to St. Louis, okay, and – 
the great experiment that was with Jeff Fisher. And he, when he when Flat that all stinks. ended, he talked to his wife about, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm done. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe I'll just I'm done with football and we'll look to the next chapter in our lives. And and Andy Reid called him, said, hey. And he, and, he, and he just knew, like, I can get back in that offense. And he loves that offense. He loved Andy. So that's when he went to Kansas City. And the same thing in Kansas City, you know, maybe that's maybe I'm done here. And Doug called him on the phone to bring him here. And it was, it was the same thing. Like, I got a chance to be around Carson. I got a chance to be around in this offense, be with Doug. And he loves the offense that much where it actually brought him back in the football. And I'm sure – I'm sure the Fazul's didn't, well, didn't, didn't matter, didn't, didn't hurt it either. Well, but I, was say, still. Did you, I don't know if you heard the. There was a story that came out. I want to say it was Sunday night, where just what you were saying about the you know talking to his wife and then Andy in Kansas City and everything like that. And then apparently he had an opportunity to go somewhere this this season and potentially start, and the money was the same, Eagles and this you know starting job. But he didn't feel like this other team was going anywhere. And he was just like, you know what? I want to go play on a winner. I'm going back to Philly. And, and, you know, they like the city. They're comfortable here, the whole deal. So, you know, I'm glad to have him back, clearly. Oh, I'm glad to have him back. And, you, listen, it's just go, credit to Howie Roseman not overlooking positions on this football team. You know, backup quarterback so important to have, and especially one that has a caliber of being a starter in this league and has been a starter. And, you know, he's the only backup that's ever in this league that's ever been to a Pro Bowl. You know, and you think about it, there's not a lot of starters in this league that have actually been to Pro Bowls that are legitimate starters right. that haven't been to Pro Bowls, and this guy has. So, like we talked about, I didn't think there's going to be a big drop, drop off in the total offense in terms of, you know, yards and, and being able to put up points and them kind of things. Is he Carson? No, of course not. You're losing the MVP of possibly the entire league and yeah. definitely your team and one of the best young players in football. You just don't replace it but you sort of you sort of did now I'm not saying that Nick won't struggle but he does what you need him to do he's not gonna turn the football over and we talked about it last Wednesday get the ball in playmakers hands you don't gotta you don't have to win the game yourself distribute the football and I thought he did a great job that Sunday and when you talk about scoring four touchdowns throwing to four touchdown passes I don't I don't care who you did against in the NFL as long as it's an NFL game. Well, yeah. You're doing it for the soul, then, then we'll, 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 we'll talk. <laughs> right, but let me throw it out there right now and call, you know, call a spade a spade. When you throw for 237 and four touchdowns, your running attack goes for over 100 at four yards a carry, and you put two field goals on the board. You know, you, you score 34 points, and, and you're the number one overall seed in, in the NFC. You need to win the game by more than five points. Jason Gasol has a question for you, Mike. Go right ahead. You can answer for him real easy. He's like, just getting on. Phil's play tonight, Mike? <laughs> you want to tell him no, what's you, going on? No, you tell, tell him. him. <laughs> He's asking you. He's asking you. He's, trying to, He's trying wondering to, if they played it. If they played it day night double header. I, tr- I saw all the Phillies girls. Trying to make our guests feel at home. Trying to make our guests feel at home. I love it. I love it. That's all. So, Jason, it's Jeff Singer, <laughs> Reading Fighting Phils, hopefully Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs this year. Jeff. Jason. How you doing, Jason? Yeah, <laughs> he's go. making me feel really comfortable and, with the Phillies gear. It's actually funny. Jason's a guy who we know a little bit from when we used to cover Conwell League and basketball. He worked with that program a little bit. And back, Jesus, 20 years ago, I actually coached a senior Babe Ruth team, and he was like the stud of the best team in the league. And I had pitchers that just wouldn't even throw to him because they couldn't get him out. He's mashing. I mean, he, he was. He was a bomber. And it was like field – we played on fields that didn't have a fence. And he would just hit it like 360, 370 and like wind up jogging around the bases. Yeah, because, because after two bounces and a roll, it was like <laughs> it was 435. Four, yeah. Um, Michael DeAndre said this is the third time Doug and Foles have been together. Correct. It is the third. Okay, rookie year in Philly. Yup. And then Kansas City, and now back here. We talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, Daniel Bakley, he made it a point to get Jeffrey the football, or he said in the game, but he nah. made a point to get Alshon the football, and that's what you that's what you want. I mean, that's why you're paying the guy number one wide receiver money. Get the football in his hands, you know, and continue to get, spread it out, man. You got weapons all over. I mean, you see what Nelson's doing, you know. You see what Hurts brings to the table. Even Bird when he's played, you know, at, at Torrey still can catch the football. So. You know, I'm not I'm not concerned offensively at all. And the only thing that's concerning me defense is what we talked about earlier on the show, and that's the Jenkins move. I think if they put him back where he belongs, I think the defense will get back to not getting torched and giving up 30 a game. Well, I like the fact that after 
you know, after Trey Burton had the big game last week with Zach Ertz out, Ertz comes back, but Doug doesn't forget about Trey Burton. You know, now he's got the the shiny toy that he's, you know, he kind of weaved him back into, you know, that little spot in the offense where at just the right time, if you can isolate him on a, a strong safety or a linebacker, I mean, that, that was. The, I think to me that was the, the best part about Foles' game on Sunday was four touchdowns to four different receivers. Got Alshon involved early. Ertz is the money guy. Nelson with the absolutely sick catch. And then the great play design to get Burton basically wide open. I mean, there wasn't a defender within 10 yards of Burton when he caught his touchdown. Nah, so, they, all bet on, they all bet up on the play. I mean, a, it, great, it, a great play design. People it, still complain. Oh, yeah, if, if, people, too much. if people want to keep ripping Doug and ripping Frank Reich about their offensive game plans, get a clue, people. The offense is not the problem with this team. They're putting up 30 a game. It's not, it's not an offensive issue. What do you got over on YouTube? Well, look, look at the last three games. The last three games, they've given up, what, it was 20, 24, 35, and 29? Yep. I mean, that's a problem. Big time problem. It's a big time problem. Especially against the Giants team. Now, you know, you never, you know, it's a divisional game. I get it. It can be a little tough, but. Not that tough. Not that tough. And, and listen, Eli, you know, has some games where it's, it looks like a little bit of the Eli of old, but look who's throwing the football too. Yeah. Look who's in their backfield. I mean, it's just, to me, it's coming out where. You know, the offense didn't feel – I felt like the offense felt like, hey, we can still go to win a Super Bowl. And the defense felt like, oh, man, we lost Carson. It was almost like the, the difference in the fan base. You know what I mean? Like, oh, we can still go to the Super Bowl, half the fan base. And then it's like, it's over. Well, you know, it's done. And I feel like that's the difference <laughs> between the Eagles' offense and I, defense I will on t- Sunday. I will tell you right now, and I have not, not yet said this out loud to anyone, anywhere at all this week. If Odell Beckham Jr. is playing in that game on Sunday, the Eagles lose. Actually, oh, well, they're probably not. They're actually, if, in, if Brandon Marshall's playing in that game on Sunday, the Eagles probably lose. Oh, well, maybe they I mean, take it more serious and e- they don't lose. It's possible, but, I mean, Eli, Eli was in that zone on Sunday so much so that any big-time receiver would have just absolutely picked the Eagles apart. Deion Brown, they need to get Matt Collins more involved. He can, he can stretch the field, and he's proven, in my eyes, that he can and will get open. And... There was a shot down the field to him in the first half on Sunday, and he looked over the wrong shoulder. And he didn't see the field after. Yeah. So, that's how it goes. He's young. It's tough. I mean, listen, you know, you saw it with Nelson. It takes wide outs right. a few years, especially in the West Coast offense, which, you know, you talk about a quarterback. Doug was talking about, oh, it takes five years to master it when he's talking about Carson in the West Coast. So, now you're talking about a wide out, which that, that takes time. And right. you saw Nelson's struggles, not only with the offense, but the mental thing mental side of the game that's a huge part of it and when you're when you have to like think about the route you're running more than just going and running it, it it's a big difference right. and I think you know year two and really that jump into year three is where a lot of these guys are like okay I'm comfortable the the, the not Odell's of the world the not I'm trying to think you know Calvin even Johnson his, even his first year you go back to like a stud even his first year right. wasn't the guy he became Antonio Brown wasn't the guy he became you know these guys grew into yeah being number one wide out. Antonio think, Brown took, what, three years? I mean, Yeah, and that's usually what it takes most guys right. at the wide out position. And that's why, you know, Matt Collins is in a good situation here. He doesn't have to be rushed. Right. You get these snaps here and there. You got veterans all over the field in front of them, and that just helps guys get better. And you I'm know, not, I thought it helped Nelson right. get better getting Alshon and Torrey. And I'm not hating on Matt Collins. Like, I, I, no, I not at him. all. I do I, too. I, you, know, I, you know, I love him. I was I, talking about man Dion. I'm yeah, just talking Matt Collins. Think, that's he's, all. Got a, he's got a ton of potential, but – that's the that's the the rookie factor there is when when you're in a game with your backup quarterback and the backup quarterback who you probably have some degree of comfort with because you're running scout team and stuff like that over the course of the week when you get in there and and he puts it up for you and you look over the wrong shoulder you know at that point backup quarterback's going to say all right I got to turn my attention back to the ones here we'll come back to this next week and, and it, it's just that simple. Yeah, you don't want to turn the football over there either. Yeah, I got a, I got a bunch of Eagles stuff here on the on the YouTube chat. It's uh, be careful what you pursue. We'll be fine as long as the O line and defense holds their own. What do you mean pursue? That's what that's the screen name. Be careful what you pursue. Ah. Uh. Well, they, uh, <laughs> I'm so confused. Well, I'm pursuing I just, a Super Bowl. What are I thought we were pursuing. pursuing right? yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't I can think of. I don't want to be offensive here, but right out of the gate, we'll be fine as long as the O line and defense hold their own. Well, thanks, Captain Obvious. <laughs> New to the show. <laughs> 
It's what we talk about every week, O-line and defense. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, we, we love you, and thanks for contributing. No, yeah, we love it. I mean, it's, that's, what, that's how you feel. Yeah. That's, that's all you got. Uh, that's all you had. <laughs> Samir plays, uh, answers the question, Jalen Mills. His holding calls are costly at times. It is, but I'll take his, I'll take his physicality. Right. Yeah, well, he, is that fair? Uh, is that a fair assessment? Oh, he follows I'll, up. I'll He's, take him being physical yeah. all day. It's been a lurking problem for him throughout his career, you know, all two years of it. I don't know if it's because he can't keep up with the matchup or just has a brain fart. Definitely like him, but he needs to eliminate that. No, he does. A, yeah. young, a young corner, a guy who almost didn't get drafted. Granted, off the field issues is part of the reason. But if you ever watched the, the gauntlet run at LSU, mm-hmm. go find that video. Just put in Jalen Mills and watch him run through the LSU gauntlet, and you'll have a different feeling <laughs> on Jalen for the rest of his career. Yeah, TTP balling. What's up, guys? What's up, TTP? And he says – Trust it. Yeah, he says, yeah, Darby played like shit, which – so I, I got I to gotta buy in on that. Uh, Jacob Bloss, Philly Dilly. He did play there? bad. Yeah. Number one guys need to lock up a bunch of guys because that's what the Giants wide receiving court was right. on Sunday. It was a bunch of guys. Number ones shut down a bunch of guys. Right. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Right. And then uh, Todd Womack says, I- I'm going to say Darby. He falls for double, mo- double moves way too much and needs to improve. Well, that's and- also not fair because now if you're not putting him in bump and run, which he wasn't on the double move, he was, he was 10 yards back off of him, you're going to be more exposed to the double move 10 yards off a receiver. It's just natural because as soon as that receiver, the whole game, they're hitting you with slants, hitting you with slants, hitting you with slants, and you're playing on a scrimmage, or, or then they back you up and you're playing off the wide out, and now he goes for that double move when they're hitting you on slants all day. It was a great play call. You know, they hit you on slants all day. Now you know he's going to bite on the slant. Because they've been exposing you all day on it. Well, so now he bites on the slant. What do they do? Hit him up over top. See, TD. I mean, okay. that, yeah. that just – well, the double move well, game happened. Well, along the same lines, though, what's Rodney McLeod's excuse? You're, you're the free safety. Everything is supposed to stay in front of you. You've been watching guys on either side do double moves all day. What's your excuse for getting burned on a double move by a guy from the slot? I mean, come on. Uh, I mean, listen, it goes around. The wing goes around. Go no, I'm just saying with the whole Malcolm Jenkins thing we got back to, like – you can't have him up in the box, especially when they're doing those double moves and everything. And then, yeah, it's all right. They're doing the slants. They're doing the slants. It's good to have him up there. And then on that double move, he gets beat. And it's everyone's – not he gets beat, but just everyone's getting beat to where you just – there's no one there to have the wide receiver, and the wide receiver is just free to go. Right. As I said, like what happened to, you know, just some cover two with two safeties over top, and then you man it up. Especially with a team like how the Giants been this year, you just – you can't get beat long, especially with how the team was. And Eli Manning's Eli Manning. I'm, I like Eli Manning. Eli Manning's a great QB. He's having his struggles this year. But knowing that it's an Eagles-Giants game, it's one of the biggest games for the year, especially for an Eagles fan, and I could only imagine for a Giants fan, you can't get beat long on that. And, all right, you let them do the slant. You let them do the slant. You let them get those five yards. You don't want them to get those 60 yards, and that's basically it. Right. And, that's, and that's what happened. Uh, Michael D'Andre, Eagles are 5-0 in the division. That's pretty damn hard to do, but championship caliber teams – Always find ways to win, and that's spot on. And I agree with that completely. So, David Roska chimes in. uh, And actually, I wanted him to chime in this week because, holy shit, (laughs) did the Rams completely annihilate boat race, come back hardcore, and lay it on the Seahawks. But here's where I want to go with this. If I'm the Philadelphia Eagles, I want to take a little bit of pride in the fact that we went to Seattle – and basically had a slugfest with the Seahawks, and the Seahawks went on to drop their next two games. I mean, and for Seahawks fans, I actually feel kind of bad that they had to go Eagles on the road at Jacksonville and Rams because the schedule makers were not forgiving to them at all. No, not at all. But you also got, you know, divisional game at home, right. Eagles at home. It's not like they, they traveled around the world for it, you know. Yeah. But, listen, over time that offense was going to get exposed. It was Russell Wilson having to make too much plays on his own. And we got uh, actually breaking news out of the uh, – at South Philly. Flyers and Red Wings now tied at three. Robert Haig, first NHL goal. Oh, breaking. Daniel Bakley, Aaron Donald laid a smackdown on Wilson. Nah, he was all over the field. That's why, that's why Aaron <laughs> Donald needs to get paid. It's, it's that simple. The fact that he hasn't got paid yet, and that's why he was holding out. And then they moved to L.A. It's like, you going to pay me? We've moved to the major market. Yeah. Wild, got out of St. Louis. Wild Jungle chimes in, E-A-G-L-E-S. Love it. Love the, love the name, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube chat's a little light, so if you got anything on the, on the book, 
Bob Hartman, I don't know how to answer the poll question. They've all been playing like shit. Guys Pick getting, one, Bob. Guys getting beat with double moves, bad angles to the receivers, bad angles when trying to make tackles. Yeah. No, it, it pick has your, Pick your least favorite. Well, I know I know who he's going to answer. He's going to answer softer than Charmin as well. He should. It's Ron. I mean, he's, no, Ron. he's your number one corner. But what was the Eagles' success when we talked about this team all year long up until the last three games? We talked about a team that really tackled well in the back end. Corners that tackled well. Safeties that tackled well. And that's something where you see a little bit of, more of a chink in the armor. You know, the Giants did a great job of getting the ball out of Eli's hands fast. You know what the front four you're going against is one of the best in football. You know your line's nobody. So they did a great job. Of, hey, we're going to get the ball out of Eli's hands quickly. All right? And our team, let's say three weeks ago, would have made open field tackles all day, but we didn't on Sunday. We didn't the Sunday before, and we, didn't the sun- we definitely didn't when we played Seattle. So it's a team on the back end that hasn't tackled well enough. Well, one of the things, not at all. Jalen Mills might be the only guy who's tackled well on that back end. Right. And one of the things you, you said earlier in the week on, on, on your videos, and I'll pose the question to both of you guys. You said that it seemed like they were playing a little bit scared, like they were playing not to lose instead of playing to win. Do you think there's any possibility at this point in the season they're also playing not to get hurt? Like they just are basically trying to get through these games as – unscathed as they can and get on to the playoffs. I, ho- I hope not, uh, not the issue. You know, I hope you're not thinking about not getting hurt. You know, that's when you get hurt. I'm hoping they're just going out and playing. You know, you, you're 12 and 2. You, you know, you're about to be 13 and 2 with a win on Monday night. You know, the only I can look at is where's the bravado at? Where's the bravado of this defense that I saw earlier on in the year? Why year in and year out does the defense start out as a, as a top 10, let's say, and they, they gradually – decline every year for the last two under Jim Schwartz and really three because you can go back to the regime before that. And big money guys stop showing up as the season gets deeper. I don't don't get that side of it. I like the part when you're saying when you're playing not to get hurt, that's when you usually get hurt. When they were talking to – who was the guy from the Steelers that was upset because he got uh, thrown out of the game for a legal hit and he was explaining, he's like, we'll play flag football now if you're going to keep it that way. Uh, just Ju- beca- yeah. Mike Mitchell. Uh, was just because Mitchell or Juju from Mike the- Mitchell. Okay, he's, Mike got, Mitchell. And he's got to take something off of a hit now, and that's when you usually get hurt when you're trying not to get hurt. Right. And if you're trying not to hurt someone, it's it's a contact game. I sucked at football. I hated football, but I loved watching it. My brother was a football player, and he loved hitting people. But if you got to slow up to hit someone and you fully can't contact them, that's when you get hurt. And when you're saying, like, they're playing not to get hurt. I hope not too, because if you're playing not to get hurt, you're probably most likely going to get hurt. And we right now we can't afford to lose anyone else to get hurt right now, especially with the playoffs that are coming up right now and the next two, three games that we need that are going to be just not even wins or losses are important. It's tone setters. I feel you got to set the tone. You got to come in. The uh, Eagles are going to have to come in and say. We're here. We're going to start the playoffs off strong, and we're just going to come in and just knock anyone out that tries to get in front of us. Right. Yeah, well, Doug's had like a wake-up call to this, right. to well, this defense. Well, and I, I, too. I, th- I think maybe the issue, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head when you talked about it, it's, it's every year as the season goes on. So what happens is that the further you get away from training camp and early season where guys are healthy and things are spaced out a little more, as the season wears on, you don't practice as much. And when you do practice, it's mostly just drills. I'd be willing to bet these guys haven't had a live practice in 10 weeks. I'll, I'll tell you right what it is. It's smelling yourself. Well, it, it, it really, it's smelling yourself. I have no issue with the pictures and, and, every, and all the fun because that comes with it. You should have fun playing sports. I love that stuff. You know, I love the dancing and all that stuff. They have fun out there. Good. Have fun out there. But when you walk around, and we talk about it, you want to walk around and take photos like you're a top five defense. You want to act like you're a top five defense. You can't come out and play like you did the last three weeks. Yeah. Okay, one week, one week things happen. Two weeks, uh, three weeks, that's trending. Yeah. That's trending. I mean, I can give you a break on two weeks. You played a Rams team that can score a ton of points. You played a Seattle team, tough to play in Seattle. The Giants, I got zero excuse for that, for the, for that performance. It's a zero. I know it's a divisional game, and, and it's going to be tight. But to get torched yeah. in the first half, there's no excuse for that. No, it's it's interesting. TTP just – Trending the wrong way, boys. Just threw in. He goes, if we could find a way to stop dink and dunk passes, we'll be fine. We no, the, just tackle. Yeah, made just the, tackle, made the offense off, gi- Made the Giants' offense look like world beaters. Secondary needs to be more disciplined. Too many stupid holdings and uh, pass interferences, PIs the last few weeks. 
For me, it became too much. Hit the electric slide. Okay. Oh, I mean, slide away. You know what I mean? I'm sliding with you at that point after the Bears win. I mean, I think I'm electric sliding in my house. You know, I don't. I, I think I played the song too, and I was electric sliding with all of them. I knew it just as well as Malcolm did. Do you, Do you buy into the whole? I really didn't electric slide, yeah, but oh, you, you, know, you don't even know how to electric. slide. You know slide. what I'm saying? Stop the excitement. It. I do so. I, don't you dare. Do not kind of want to. I kind of want to see you do the electric slide. <laughs> nah, now, it, it, there video. Be there could video. Be, uh, there, <laughs> there could be tape. <laughs> there could be tape. Um, do you guys buy into the whole home road split at all? Because these all, these three games have all happened on the road. And we see them kind of come out and lay their thing down at home to the, you know, I mean, what is their their home home victory margin is, like, ridiculous. So, you know, there's something to be said for defending your home field and playing well at home. But, but how much do you guys buy into the whole home road split and the fact that, you know, this top 10 defense gave up that many points on the road? <sighs> Maybe, but not when you. But what do we talk about week in, week out? Though we talk about what what do great teams do? You know, their defense travels. Right. You know, and that's what you say about every great team, a Super Bowl contending team, or teams that win Super Bowls. Is you know one thing going on the road? My defense is going to come. You know, even my offense doesn't show up. My defense is going to show up, and and they just have it. And it it, it is it's poor tackling. You know, uh, Dan McGuckin saying why are we playing all so much? Giants abuse. There's uh, what do you say? Giants, yeah, Giants abuse those slants. Why can't we get up closer to the line? And, you know, I don't know. You should trust in these two guys to be able to play press coverage. You should trust all of them. But then again, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, different different game plans for, for different football teams, too. You know, okay, you want to play off the Giants, whatever. But I think they were pressing at times, and they were getting beat. And then they weren't pressing, and they were getting beat. I just think they got exposed, really. I think they got exposed. I think a lot of that's to do with smelling yourself and, and – you know, it being that easy for the defense all season long where they got early leads by the offense and what can the defense do? Now we can pin our ears back and go get them. Well, now you look at a game like Sunday, and I think which is the thing I can take best out of Sunday's win was that you're down 20-7. to If you would have told me that, they were down 20-7, to I'm worried. Right. I'm worried. And what do you saw about Foles and the, and the offense? And that's what you can hang your hat on still is that, you know, they could have folded. No ends, woe is me. Right. And they came out and battled and ended up winning the football game. So, I can take a lot out of that. Pop Mon and say, what's up, fellas? What's up, Pop? Just tuning in. Uh, Daniel Bakley just said, just need to practice better. Her coaches were going to light – what is he saying? Light them up for playing – what is he saying? We're going light on them for playing three road games in a row, two being out west. But they need to stay more constant with the practicing is what he's saying. It's tough to read these comments sometimes. <laughs> Bob Hartman, I'm fine with the dink and dunk. And, and I agree with Bob. I'm fine with teams dink and dunk. You got to tackle. That's bad, but don't break. Too, too much breaking recently. So, you know, I look at it as dink and dunk. If, if you're playing to prevent defense, what do I always say? Prevent does nothing but prevent you from winning. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Bakley wants. No, 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 you're right. What does prevent do? Every time my dad sits there when he's over, uh, he's over Christmas right now. He doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have a clue. But he's right. You know, he doesn't have a clue like I do. That's all I'm saying. You know? I'm not saying he's clueless. <laughs> he's just not as in tune as the kid is. You know what I mean? The junior. Not in tune. But he is in tune. But my point is he's sitting there. Well, is he in tune or is he not in tune? I'm giving him a middle. I'm giving him a split. A I'm split. trying to be classy. All right. But he can sit down and be like, all this does, you prevent yourself from winning. You prevent yourself from winning. All, they, all teams do is score when you play prevent defense. I'm like, he's right. I much want to say he's wrong. But you're right. <laughs> but going, going back to, like, the home or away games, it's still the Giants. It's right. the Eagles Giants game, and me growing up, when ever the Eagles were playing the Giants, it was the biggest game of the year for mm-hmm. us. It's like playing the Cowboys, but the Giants are only an hour drive north for us. So I feel like that's more of an excuse, saying, "All right, they've had three road games, but that third road game was against the Giants." Being an Eagles fan, I feel the Eagles players who've been around with the Eagles for the last four or five years. Nick Foles, he came in and he knew that he was playing the Giants, and he's the one that came in and. He had the four touchdowns because he. I bet you he was fired up because he knew how Philly feels about the Giants, how he feel, how we feel about New York. So, I feel that would just be more of an excuse saying, "All right, we've been on the road two weeks in a row. We're on another." It's that third game was shouldn't even be considered a road game because nah. if you would have heard the fans and everyone screaming at the end of that game, Eli Manning was having trouble hearing at the end of the game, and it was his home turf. Like, I, I thought it was just more of an excuse. You gotta when it's a rivalry game like that. It doesn't matter where you are. If it's a neutral site, home or away, you got to be fired up for that game, especially as players. And I feel 
Maybe they just didn't came, come ready to play. Maybe they were just trying not to get hurt, but I feel none of that's really an excuse. I feel they should have just came in and just – that should have been a 42 to 12 game. Like, it should have been like a 42 to 14 no, game. And you can even like say that. the Rams game, even though it was out west, was a home game. Yeah. All right, well, let, let's, take this a, like, let's take this a layer deeper now, though. What concerns me more about this than anything else is you're getting ready to go into the playoffs, okay? And you look at the three teams that just laid a ton of points on them. Pete Carroll and his coaching staff, great offensive minds, okay? Sean McVay. Depends who you ask. What's that? Depends who you ask. Well, yes, and, Marshawn and, and, Lynch, you well, might have a different opinion. Fine. That's, <laughs> hey, they, they find ways to get their, their, get their guys into space. You know, Marshawn, it's another story. But you look at, you, you know, you look at Sean McVay. And his coaching staff, great offensive minds. And then you go to New York, and, you know, Ben McAdoo's out of there. Basically, Spagnuolo just turned the entire offense over to Mike Sullivan and said, go ahead, dude, have fun with it. And, and, and I'm sure Eli has a big say yeah, in what and, they're doing and, now, too. Yeah, and between, between Sullivan and Eli, you know, they're getting creative with it. So now, as, as you know, you're, you're starting to head to the playoffs, and you have teams with better coaches – and more creative play calling. Like like Mitchell Trubisky, yeah. with all due respect, and John Fox, who is a dinosaur, right. especially on the offensive side of the football, look, that's a different story. Right. You should dominate them. You know what I mean? Most defenses do. The Detroit Lions defense, who are, in my opinion, are a bunch of guys, dominated Chicago Bears. So – you, you know what I'm saying in terms of defensively? Right. No, so and you're I, right. And I get you're that. right. So I now mean, you're seeing higher-level coaching. Right. Or – Higher level quarterback play, right? You know, in Eli, who's been around the game forever, and probably had a lot to do well, you had, with the game plan leading yeah, up, you especially had, that you had pretty Ross, much that coach, right? Eli was pretty much the offense. Well, you had Russ Goff and Eli, Eli back to back to back. So. Yeah, so you're getting you're getting legitimate notes. So that's and that's spot on. But this is where you need. Well, then to. let's see what happens this week at home with Derek Carr. Uh, listen, a good it's, op- it's a good young quarterback. Good young quarterback. Good offense, offense is struggling a little bit, but Marshawn. Some Skittles yeah, well, going on. Yeah, there. He's fun I love to watch. Skittles. I love, love watching Skittles. him. He's fun to you know, watch. It's, it's funny, though, because he has a great time. To we've watch gone that. back and forth all season about the whole narrative about, oh, the Eagles didn't play anyone, and we say, well, but they didn't make the schedule. Before the season, everyone talked about how bad they were going to be because their schedule was so hard. And then all of a sudden, then it circles back, and they didn't play anyone. Well, to me, they just played three teams in a row that lit them up for a bunch of points, and they still. You know, they still won two of them. It says a lot so, about what, what, what has been built two, here. That's right. a big two and one. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it's huge, and it shows credit to Doug. You know, you, you start winning, and guys start buying in even more and more and more than maybe they even did before. You know, first year, you go you go for all them fourth downs. You, you show your offense that you believe in them, but you're setting a, you're setting a culture. You're setting it like we're not scared type culture in my opinion and you did that last year and okay yeah it didn't end the way we wanted to as Eagles fans but I still stuck by Doug's decision so now when you go for it on fourth and goal in, in LA right and the guy's got a torn ACL but nobody knows it yet and you get that them kind of things were built from last year and nobody really puts any stock in that but it was these guys are human beings man right. it's not you're not playing Madden and I got to tell people that all the time. Like, culture is important. We, we were sold culture with Chip Kelly, but nothing was really built. There was, I mean, a foundation wasn't even built, right? I mean, the concrete might have been laid, but that's it. He was like fake news. Yeah, so – but but this is a real culture. Wow, this, is, this is an NFL guy, a former player who, who gets NFL players. That matters. It matters so much. And he's, he was a grinder because he's been a backup his whole life. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't – nothing came easy to Doug. Like most, like superstars would. And this is why it makes these guys better coaches. So now he can talk to you more on, on a grinding level. And I think all that's led up to, and obviously having Carson and his development all tied hand in hand, but it's all led you up to where you're at now and you're 12-2. and two, And it, it's all because you set it up last year. That's why people were so mad in the Seattle game. Oh, why did he go for it on fourth down at the 50? You know, that's not the way we played all year. And, and people were right. You played all year a certain way. Fourth and ones, we're gonna go for it. You know, fourth and two in the right field position, we're gonna we're gonna play aggressive. Well, I, and I love that. And to your point, I think players do too. I think players want to play for that. To to me, Sunday may have been Doug's best game call of the year, because as I as I watched the game on Sunday, I think there was literally one play for the entire game that I disagreed with, and that was when they went for it on fourth and one, 
rather than doing a quarterback sneak where they had been, uh, what, like 13 for 13 all year? Now, granted, a lot of it's Carson, but it's, you know, fourth and a yard. Foles is six foot five. Just run the quarterback sneak again. Don't, don't get fancy and try to hand it off. Was literally the only play of the entire game offensively that I disagreed with. So, yeah. I, I thought it was his best, best called game of the year. Yeah, I do too. I do too, and I thought he's had a lot of good ones. I really – I love his play calling. I like his play design. I like everything he brings to the table that. Michael D'Angelo wanted predictions before he passed out. We'll get to that in one second. <laughs> All right. Vinny Mastin, Raiders offense is nothing this year like it was last year. What's up, fellas? What up, Vinny? What's up, Vinny? Stream smart. Vinny, use the A2D promo code. No, didn't they lay 40 on the Chiefs earlier? The Raiders, yeah. They're inconsistent. They are inconsistent. They're not bad. They're inconsistent. Their defense is atrocious. Pop on as teams the last few weeks have been able to run the ball, and that's a little worrisome. The Saints, Vikings, Rams all can run the rock. Got to tighten up these last few games. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. I'm looking right in the middle of my $100 million man and say, I don't care if you're getting double, triple, quadruple team. I need you. We need you. Look, pay the fifty grand. make your problems go away. Yes. Get your head back on football. Yes, I don't care whose wife you backed. Really don't care. <laughs> Get back for the greater good. It's That's why I said. The guy who complained about this, take one for the goddamn team. All right? I know it's your wife, and it's tough to swallow. Slump and maybe she it. said that too. But, oh. hey, but take one for the team. We're on a great stretch. Are these playing great? Well, he's from and North Carolina. He's probably a Panthers fan. True. From. Daniel Bakley, thank God Oakland's secondary is atrocious. And Michael D'Andrea, you are what your record is. All right, so we're twelve and two. Twelve and two. Twelve and I'll two. Take it. Uh, Pop Mon, it's got box seats for Christmas game, fellas. Let's go, Eagles. Oh, that's nice. That a boy, Pop. Uh, uh, Dottie Eberhardt. I hope we have a flashback. What we did the Raiders last time we played them in Philly when Nick Foles was quarterback. We played him in Oakland, but it I'll take, Oakland, I'll take yeah, that I'll, flashback. I'll though. take those seven touchdowns. Yeah. And uh, so let's get into predictions. Player of the game, well, offense, defense. We'll go to the guest first. I'm thinking Nick Foles is going to do close to what he did last time. I think Nick Foles player of the game. He's going to have four touchdowns with around like 420 yards, something close to that. And he's just going to sling it. And I'm really looking forward to it. And I think the defense is going to do good. I think it's going to be a – I think the Eagles are going to win by a lot, honestly. I, I like Derek Carr. I think he's a tough dude, plays really well. And But I think we just got to focus on their running game more and just stop them. And I think it's going to be around like a – Probably like 45 to 17, 45 to 20 game. Christmas night massacre. It's funny because we're actually not that far off. I'm going 38, 20 birds. I don't even think it's that close. I think second half you start seeing a lot of substitutions, maybe a late score by the Raiders. Uh, I'm going Zach Ertz. Player, offensive player of the game. And we'll go Ron. Oh, defensive player of the game, maybe putting a putting a little money where his mouth is. So we'll go Ron Darby. Dan McGuckin, he'll be in section two nineteen on Monday night. Another guy going. Yo, Dan, I'll be in two twenty. Whoa, right next door. Wait, no, two thirty. You don't even know what the hell section. This is what happens when he drinks too much before games. <laughs> he drinks so much you don't even know what freaking. <laughs> have- twenty goddamn years. Twenty years. I got a pattern. I had to think about it for a second. It's two two thirty, row twenty, seat ten. You just go. Like you yeah. like it's at this point now where you just know where you're going. Well, here's the thing: is muscle memory. Pe- people don't even ask me for tickets anymore. It's literally like. Can I get I, some tickets? I walk. Well, no. I mean, it's like. <laughs> right? I, when I mean people, I mean like that work no, there. I'm joking, I'm joking. I walk in and it's like, you know, the usher at the bottom of the section is Marie. Marie high fives. She doesn't ask for my ticket. Marie high she fives. knows. You know. We, as we go up the escalator, the guy working the escalator is Tom. Tom's not supposed to let us on the escalator because it's not for our sections, but he lets us on because, you know, we know him and we just high-five Tom on the way by. It's all about who you know. It's, but it's, it's just, you know, it's a familiarity thing. I don't even look at my ticket. I don't know where I sit. It's great, though. I just go, go to my seat. Daniel Bakery, 31-17, a jolly kills the Raiders with 130 and two TDs. I like that one. Dan McGuckin, 38-17, Burrs, Foles in the running game. Plays good as usual. Defense rebounds. Uh, Vinny Madison, they scored 31 on KC, the second highest total this year, and the second time they scored 15. They stink. He's not a fan of the Raiders. And <laughs> either is their coach. He's not a fan of their culture anymore. Michael D'Andrea, what uniforms are they wearing? Possibly a blackout? Mm, possibly. I don't think they've announced it yet. Have they gone blackout this year? No, right? They went blackout once. What game did they go blackout on? 
was a Washington Monday night game, I believe. No. They all run together wins. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're all starting to run together. Five and zero <laughs> in division. They it, run it, together. it actually wouldn't surprise me if they went green on Sunday because it's Christmas and they go blackout against the Cowboys on New Year's Eve day. Oh, could do that, that one. I'd like that too. Yeah, blackout the Cowboys. I got a, I got a couple here. Uh, actually, TTV Ball and makes a Sixers point that I want to hit real quick, and we'll get into more of it when we go Sixers. Just want to throw out there that Ben shot the ball six times in 33 minutes last night. With no Embiid. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that for sure. Um, and then he also said, Chip preached culture but never built it. He just got rid of guys and used culture as an excuse. And then Matt Lewis says, yo, singer. Matt Lewis? Matt Lewis. What's up, Matty? Yo, singer. <laughs> Dan McGuckin, they were black against the Broncos. No, it was so. Broncos. Okay. Uh, Vinny Mastin, 34-17 Eagles. Uh, Dan McGuckin, outshine offensive player of the game. Uh, Nigel, defense player of the game. They'll contain Marshawn. So Break, I'm going. Breaking news out of MLB after you give your score here. 30. Let's go 34. You really want to defense the, the rebound? 34-10. Oh. Shut it down. Put, putting the heat on them. Shut it down. And a late TD by the Raiders. A little Monday Night Massacre. You know who my player of the game is, man. Things don't change on this seat. That's Nelson. All day. I'm riding with my dog. And listen, if you, <laughs> again, if you look at his girl. Just go find him on Instagram and take a peek of what's on his arm. And you'll know mentally why the game's strong this year and real freaking strong. Well, I mean, how can you? Maybe, I might, listen, maybe, if I got, hold on. If I, hold, I'm a married man. If I wear my beak in that, I might go catch 100 hold yards. Up. I hold, might. Hold up. I mean, it's Be- aggressive. Okay, but here's the thing. It is, it is, it is, a, it is let, delicious. Let, let, let's, 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 Sorry, I just let, had to get Let's stop, that, let's get stop that this for a second and think about what you just said. Girl on his arm where she's supposed to be instead of hose on his lap. True. Okay. True. He wasn't alone. Okay. He was straight. He lived okay. like the glitter. He did love the uh-huh. glitter. I forgot. He loved the glitter. She looked like she probably put a little glitter on too. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know. I don't know her background. Talk about motivation to play. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think he goes for over 100, another touchdown, maybe even two on Monday night. And defensively, <sighs> I'm going to go Jalen. All right. I'm going to go Jalen. Jalen gets a pick six Monday night. So, I was thinking about going Malcolm, but I just know that Jim's a dope. <laughs> I just know Jim's a dope. I know he's not going to change. I'm going to beg him to change again. He won't change. And can we just get Corey Graham off the field? And then we're going to go to a break in a minute. Yeah, here. I was going to say, I know we've got to go to a break. Go to the break. Go to the baseball. We'll hit some more scores when we come back from the people. But uh, So, Carlos Santana signs with the Phillies. Indians today go out and get their replacement. They sign first baseman Yonder Alonzo. Two years, $16 million, Club option for a third mm-hmm. year. Reported by Ken Rosenthal and NFLB Network. Or NFLB. Yeah, MLB Network. Uh, Club has yet to confirm, though. So, Yonder Alonzo, not a bad signing. No, nah, they got so much talent on that on that roster. Yeah. That team's good. You just got to fill <laughs> it in. Yeah. <laughs> Love Jeff, just that team's good. Great manager. Yeah. It's a good team. Great young talent. You know, one one win away mm-hmm. from winning it, winning it all. That's yeah. how curses end. Like we talked a few weekends ago, a few Wednesdays ago, I mean. That's how curses end. You know, like Francisco Lindor might be one of my favorite players in Major League Baseball oh, I love today, Lindor. too. Love him. Just, love like him. I, just like I loved half the Astros when they were not coming up and when they first got up. Like, how could you not? Like, if you if you watch Carlos Correa play and you said you didn't like him, like, what's wrong with you? You know, you watch Altuve bat, he's five, six and a half. I say, you, if know, that, you know I got a soft spot for, for, <laughs> for short second baseman. But it's just like, it get, I mean, that's a great for kids, man. That keeps yeah. kids playing, like, the game of baseball. Like, the, you know that, man, I could be five, six and be the best hitter in the game. Like, the best pure hitter in the game. Every kid that i like, been training this year when we're talking about hitting, I'm like, who'd you like watching hitting this year? Just hoping they would say, like, Reese Hoskins or Cody Ballinger because – I kind of know, like, their stances now pretty well. And they're like, oh, Altuve. Every kid, every kid is saying Altuve now. And it's been wild. It's been wild just seeing him play and perform. Cool. Yeah, Daniel Baker said, Lindor and Ramirez are solid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Dottie Eberhardt, I got tickets. I'm going to the game. I'm sitting right behind the Eagles. I'm excited. That's awesome. Yeah, a girl, Dottie. Monday night. Um, and Daniel Baker said, Alonzo was solid. Solid signing. Nice. And we're going to get into Phil's. We'll continue our fills. We'll talk about some guys they got lined up. Well, some guys they got deals done with. Tommy Hunter, obviously. Uh, Nishek back. 
you know, we'll see if we're competing if he wants to finish if he wants to pitch back to backs or not. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Because that doesn't nobody nobody sat here and thought about that. Like like the guy, and I know what he's doing for his career, but I never like that. Like I never like a guy being like, oh, you know, I'm not gonna do back to backs. You're a reliever, dude. What are you talking about? You can't do back to backs. Like you know, big time this went somewhere else, got traded, and then came back and signed. So now will you go back to backs? Like I wonder if that was part of the contract discussion. Like you want to go back to backs about five months ago, maybe not even. Will you go back to backs now? Actually, oh, you will. Okay, go ahead. Actually, let's hold, not. hold the phone though. Let, let's let's rewind this. Not. Maybe we. I mean, maybe there was some you know backroom handshake agreement that if his name came up in trade talks last year, they would stop him throwing back to backs just so he wouldn't be spent. If he was going to a playoff contender somewhere. That's the only thing I can think of. It's, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really that worried about it. No. You know, whatever. I, I like him. It's a good signing. All Tommy right. Hunter, good signing as well. TTP ball in 33-24 birds. Foles, three touchdowns a pick. A giant huge game. Brandon Graham, DPO, TG, two sacks. Let's go to break. I love that. <sighs> I love that. Uh, Dottie, Everhart, score going to be 35-10. That's good. So we'll talk about maybe a little Machado, Stroman. Archer, I just went six to midnight Archer. I mean, you, you put Archer in a conversation with me. Do the deal. Yeah. Do the deal. Do what you got to do to get the deal done. Uh, Sixers continue to struggle, man. Oof. Continue to struggle. No JoJo. And and I know there's a lot of heat on Brett Bram, but talent wins, and we'll get into that later on in the show. Yep. You know, I thought Brett's done a good job with what he's had, but when you have your freaking point guard who shoots six times, six times, and can't shoot a shot past 12 feet, he did last night, though, for the first time. Yeah. He did have a little pull-up jumper. And it shows you, he can shoot it, man. I think he, he just... He can't score if you don't shoot. I just think he stopped last night while the getting was good. Boys, he's too talented. He's, and this is why... And he's young, and I, and, and I know this, okay? But killers kill. Right? Killers kill in the NBA. Like, when Kobe came up, he was a killer right off the bat. Mm. Now, even when he was young, you could see he had a little killer in him. You know, Durant had killer in him right away. Even LeBron had killer in him right away. You know, sometimes in games... It's the disappears. longest freaking tease ever. I know. <laughs> this long. But I, just, I started to get into it. But I just need more killer out of Ben. We'll talk about that. We'll continue our Eagles talk. All that much more. Tom. Mike. AM. In the PM. HDRadio.com. This was brought to you by Gibson Mayor LLC. Our certified public account. Make, Make them, them yours. yours. Find them on the web. GibsonMayor.com. And Daniel Baker says, yell it's over Azuna all day. Going All day. All day. All right. That's all I'm going to say, Tom. I don't know what he thinks. That he, I, does he not realize I'm on the same side of that? We're we'll good. talk about coming back. We'll be back. Hi, folks. Bob Mannery here. You're listening to A2D Radio, real sports talk radio for the fans, by the fans, no agenda. These guys are the best in the business. Hashtag it. No notes. Tom and Mike, AM in the PM, is brought to you by Gibson Mayer, LLC, certified public accountants. Gibson Mayer, located in Yardley, PA, is a leading accounting and business consulting firm with a proven track record of handling critical issues with expertise across many different industries, including construction, distribution, hospitality, manufacturing, real estate, service trades, merchandising, professional services, and professional athletes. Give them a call at 215-369-3300. That's 215-369-3300. Your initial consultation is always free, and if you tell them that Mike from Tom and Mike AM in the PM sent you, you'll receive 15% off all income tax services completed by February 15th. That's Gibson Mayer, LLC, 
certified public accountants, 215-369-3300, or visit them on the web at www.gibsonmayor.com. That's www.gibsonmayor.com. Hey, do you need to get your skills in shape? Then contact the Sconzano Sports Center, located at 5 Carnegie Plaza in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. You can give them a call at 856-889-3434 or visit them on the web at www.sconzanosports.com. John Sconzano offers individual, semi-private, and team training lessons in hitting, pitching, catching, outfield along with turf rentals. The Sconzano Sports Center is equipped with a 31,000 square foot indoor facility, four batting cages, and a 4,000 square foot strengthening and conditioning room. So what are you waiting for? Contact the Sconzano Sports Center today. A2DRadio.com is sponsored by the Sports Outlet. For all your sporting needs, located at 703 Black Horse Pike in Glendora, New Jersey, give them a call at 856-939-2030 or email them at sportsaladnj at comcast.net or visit them on the web at www.sportsaladinc.com. For all your sporting needs, the Sports Outlet. Tom Arnone. Big Mikey Smalls, Tom, Mike, AM, in the PM, only on A2DRadio.com. A2DRadio.com is proudly sponsored by Gibson Mayer LLC Certified Public Accountants. Gibson Mayer, located in Yardley, PA, is a leading accounting and business consulting firm with a proven track record of handling critical issues with expertise across many different industries, including construction, distribution, hospitality, manufacturing, real estate, service trades, merchandising, professional services, and professional athletes. Give them a call at 215-369-3300. That's 215-369-3300. Your initial consultation is always free. And if you tell them that Tom and Mike from AM and the PM sent you, you'll receive 15% off all income tax services completed by February 15th. That's Gibson Mayor LLC Certified Public Accountants, 215-369-3300. 3300 or visit them on the web at www.gibsonmayor.com. That's gibsonmayor.com. Do you need to get your skills in shape? Then contact the Sconzano Sports Center, located at 5 Carnegie Plaza in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. You can give them a call at 856-889-3434 or visit them on the web at www.sconzanosports.com. John Sconzano offers individual, semi-private, and team training lessons in hitting, pitching, catching, outfield, along with turf rentals. The Sconzano Sports Center is equipped with a 31,000 square foot indoor facility, four batting cages, and a 4,000 square foot strengthening and conditioning room. So what are you waiting for? Contact the Sconzano Sports Center today. A2DRadio.com is sponsored by the Sports Outlet. For all your sporting needs, located at 703 Black Horse Pike in Glendora, New Jersey, give them a call at 856-939-2030 or email them at sportsaladnj at comcast.net or visit them on the web at www.sportsaladinc.com. For all your sporting needs, the Sports Outlet. You're listening to Tom and Mike, AM in the PM, on A2DRadio.com.
Tom and Mike AM in the PM is brought to you by Gibson Mayer LLC, certified public accountants. Gibson Mayer, located in Yardley, PA, is a leading accounting and business consulting firm with a proven track record of handling critical issues with expertise across many different industries, including construction, distribution, hospitality, manufacturing, real estate, service trades, merchandising, professional services, and professional athletes. Give them a call at 215-369-3300. That's 215-369-3300. Your initial consultation is always free, and if you tell them that Mike from Tom and Mike AM and the PM sent you, you'll receive 15% off all income tax services completed by February 15th. That's Gibson Mayer, LLC, Certified Public Accountants, 215-369-3300. Or visit them on the web at www.gibsonmayer.com. That's www.gibsonmayer.com. Hey, do you need to get your skills in shape? Then contact the Sconzano Sports Center, located at 5 Carnegie Plaza in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. You can give them a call at 856-889-3434 or visit them on the web at www.sconzanosports.com. John Sconzano offers individual, semi-private, and team training lessons in hitting, pitching, catching, outfield along with turf rentals. The Sconzano Sports Center is equipped with a 31,000 square foot indoor facility, four batting cages, and a 4,000 square foot strengthening and conditioning room. So what are you waiting for? Contact the Sconzano Sports Center today. A2DRadio.com is sponsored by the Sports Outlet. For all your sporting needs, located at 703 Black Horse Pike in Glendora, New Jersey, give them a call at 856-939-2030 or email them at sportsalladnj at comcast.net or visit them on the web at www.sportsalladinc.com. For all your sporting needs, the Sports Outlet. You're listening to Tom and Mike, AM in the PM. Here on A2DRadio.com. A2DRadio.com is proudly sponsored by Gibson Mayer LLC Certified Public Accountants. Gibson Mayer, located in Yardley, PA, is a leading accounting and business consulting firm with a proven track record of handling critical issues with expertise across many different industries, including construction, distribution, hospitality, manufacturing, real estate, service trades, merchandising, professional services, and professional athletes. Give them a call at 215-369-3300. That's 215-369-3300. Your initial consultation is always free. And if you tell them that Tom and Mike from AM and the PM sent you, you'll receive 15% off all income tax services completed by February 15th. That's Gibson Mayer LLC Certified Public Accountants, 215-369-3300. Or visit them on the web at www.gibsonmayer.com. That's gibsonmayer.com. Do you need to get your skills in shape? Then contact the Sconzano Sports Center, located at 5 Carnegie Plaza in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. You can give them a call at 856-889-3434 or visit them on the web at www.sconzanosports.com. John Sconzano offers individual, semi-private, and team training lessons in hitting, pitching, catching, outfield along with turf rentals. The Sconzano Sports Center is equipped with a 31,000 square foot indoor facility, four batting cages, and a 4,000 square foot strengthening and conditioning room. So what are you waiting for? Contact the Sconzano Sports Center today. A2D 
BeatyRadio.com is sponsored by the Sports Outlet. For all your sporting needs, located 703 Black Horse Pike in Glendora, New Jersey, give them a call at 856-939-2030 or email them at sportsalladnj at comcast.net or visit them on the web at www.sportsalladinc.com. For all your sporting needs, the Sports Outlet. Tom Arnone, Big Mikey Smalls, Tom, Mike, AM, in the PM, only on A2DRadio.com. A2DRadio.com is proudly sponsored by Gibson Mayer LLC Certified Public Accountants. Gibson Mayer, located in Yardley, PA, is a leading accounting and business consulting firm with a proven track record of handling critical issues with expertise across many different industries, including construction, distribution, hospitality, manufacturing, real estate, service trades, merchandising, professional services, and professional athletes. Give them a call at 215-369-3300. That's 215 215- Three six nine three three zero zero. Your initial consultation is always free, and if you tell them that Tom and Mike from AM and the PM sent you, you'll receive fifteen percent off all income tax services completed by February fifteenth. That's Gibson Mayer LLC Certified Public Accountants two one five three six nine three three zero zero, or visit them on the web at www.gibsonmayer.com. That's gibsonmayer.com. Do you need to get your skills in shape? Then contact the Sconzano Sports Center, located at 5 Carnegie Plaza in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. You can give them a call at 856-889-3434 or visit them on the web at www.sconzanosports.com. John Sconzano offers individual, semi-private, and team training lessons in hitting, pitching, catching, outfield, along with turf rentals. The Sconzano Sports Center is equipped with a 31,000 square foot indoor facility, four batting cages, and a 4,000 square foot strengthening and conditioning room. So what are you waiting for? Contact the Sconzano Sports Center today. A2DRadio.com is sponsored by the Sports Outlet. For all your sporting needs, located at 703 Black Horse Pike in Glendora, New Jersey, give them a call at 856-939-2030 or email them at sportsalladnj at comcast.net or visit them on the web at www.sportsalladinc.com. For all your sporting needs, the Sports Outlet. Well, hello again, everyone. This is Bob Mannery, and you're listening to Tom and Mike. AM in the PM, only on A2D Radio. Tom and Mike, these guys are fucking awesome. But their side piece, Greg, that guy is a goddamn problem. Uh, we're back, Tom. Mike. I am. In the PM. HDRadio.com, live from the BMW of Atlantic City Studios. BMW of Atlantic City, Rollback 17 of the Parkway. Find them online, BMW of Atlantic City. 
Gibson.com. Every Wednesday night, we're brought to you by our certified public accountant. Make, Make them yours. yours. Gibson Mayer LLC. Find them on the web. GibsonMayer.com. Tom Renner, Michael, Michael Mataraki, Greg Mwakovic, and West Sunny. Side. Sunny. L.A. Sunny. in and out Burger L.A. Yeah, put on a few, I'm sure. Throwing down a few. Thanks, Jeff Singer. I don't hate. Like, thank Jeff Singer for coming on with yeah, us that earlier. Was lot, that was a lot of fun with Singh coming in. In the first segment. You can catch him in double A for the fight in Phil's this year. And you don't even know. It could call up. It could be sooner than later. Throw in mid-90s. Lefty closer. Lefty, Ra- lefty closer mid-90s. Okay. Could, ha- could on the happen. And, twos. and if it just joins our poll question, brought to you by Scanzano Sports. Find them on the web, ScanzanoSports.com. Which member of the Eagles secondary was most to blame for the Birds' defensive woes on Sunday? Malcolm Jenkins, Ronald Darby, Patrick Robinson, Roddy McLeod, Com- Jalen Comment Mills, on anybody somebody else. else, Jim yeah. Schwartz. Let us know Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. A2D Radio is where you can find us. We we start. We listen. We told. We we recapped a lot of the Giants game. We gave mm-hmm. our predictions for the Raiders game. You can still chime in with yours. We'll read them off on air. Player of the game, offense, defense, score predictions. Let us know. Uh, we talked some Phil's winter meetings earlier on. We'll get. We'll, Get into a little bit more of guys they're targeting, that their names attached to. We'll get into that. Sixers continue to struggle. We'll finish the show off with tonight. Right. So we'll continue with your guys' questions. Some people chiming in, like Deion Brown. Don't let Dougie P escape either. From my opinion, he he needs to put his QB under center way more. This way more. This is the NFL, not college. It may be different formation and play that can be ran whether the QB is under center. And I actually like, and I think the NFL's gotten more to this, where I was a lot of say, QBs I, are in the gun. I disagree with it. I actually think the NFL's become a much more shotgun-oriented league than it used to be. Granted. You can uh, see more, to, little, you can his, see more from, yeah, from back a little bit than you do I, up of the line. I understand his point about this is not college. I think if it was college, you'd see guys lined up in the pistol which you don't see. You see guys in the shotgun, but usually it's one back offset or or a lot of times no backs. Yeah. I, so I, I, I agree with you that it's, you know, that is the way that the league is going. It's, not a, a, your, it's not a college thing. And a lot of your RPOs, you know, come from being in the gun, being able to see defenses and sort of pick and choose what you want right. to do and what you're going to turn it into. So I, I have no issue with and the Doug, formations. Doug actually has a better mix of – shotgun and under center than Chip did for sure. Oh well Chip was never. I mean it was never even part of the offense. And if you and if you look at what Andy runs in Kansas City right now, Alex Smith is constantly in shotgun. We got Ralphie D real quick. What's the up, Ralphie? Lakers beat the Rockets. That's a dub. Wow. That is, that is a big win. Gotta give credit where credit's due. That's a big win. Uh Daniel Bakley was talking about the yellow shit over Azuna. We can talk about that later on. Um and Deion Brown says, really look at how many times Aaron Rodgers is in the pistol and on a gun. Let me know. He's in the gun a lot. Yeah. Rodgers is in the gun a lot, Deion. He really is. I don't know if he's in the pistol, but he's definitely in the gun. But we don't have, like, pistol formations. No, I mean. You know? It's it's gun. Well, it's see, here's, here's the problem is that in the NFL, defensive linemen, especially defensive ends, are way too fast for you to line a running back up in a pistol. I mean, if, you're, if your quarterback is four to five yards – off of the line in a shotgun, and then you're going to line a running back up three yards behind him in pistol? No. I mean, you can't run offense that way in the NFL because defensive linemen are just way too fast. No, Dan, you're my guy. I love you. But, you know, I have no issue with them being in the gun. It's part of the offense. Quarterbacks can see the line of scrimmage, see the secondary better. It's easier for them to audible in and out. They are under they are under center at times, but most of the league that have legit quarterbacks are, are in the gun. And it's just the way it is. And uh, Daniel Bay said, Rodgers used the pistol the last two years. So, and he's thinking about it. say, okay, I got to do my homework. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Do we do we understand what the difference is between shotgun and pistol? Not you, but the, the audience. I mean, teams in the NFL use pistol sparingly. Pistol is when you actually line up in the I formation, but with the quarterback in shotgun. Everything starts four to five yards back. You very rarely see pistol in the NFL. Yeah, I think Rodgers more in the gun. Yeah, it's too. more. Yeah, it's the Not gun. Not saying that they haven't tried it because they've had running no, back I mean, issues and but there, you know, and different there, things like that. And they, I mean, there are teams that have tried it, 
but it's rare. I mean, it's very rare in the NFL. I see the Cowboys try it once in a while with with Zeke and Dak, but most of it's out. Listen, most of it's out of the gun with most of these teams in the league, and it's RPOs. Right, running back is usually offset to the right because most quarterbacks are right-handed. And away you go. Yeah, and I'm not saying everything's been perfect with like oh, yeah. every game plan or this, that, and the third. But, you know, I just feel like for a quarterback, if I can see everything back further, I can decide what better play to get my offense in. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's the play call being called in is one thing. That's one thing. Right. Getting you in the right play at the line is what separates your average and below average teams from your teams that – our first, second, and third in their respective conferences. That's just real. It is. No, it's real and talk. That's why knowing Nick, having Nick as your backup, and him getting thrown into the fire, per se, is why I was confident in him, is because he can still do all this at the line of scrimmage because we go back to him knowing the offense so well. Yeah. So it all ties in to Nick being able to take us. I know to fix his poll question was, you know, how far can Nick Foles take us? Right. And, or, you know, and, and I said definitely Super Bowl contender. Well, that, that was basically I mean, our poll question last week. Yeah, you can't. With a little different a little spin twist. to you it. Can't, yeah. I mean, you can't say he's going to win it. Right. But, I mean, as, as a contender, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, like we talked about earlier, can the defense get, you know, get in shape? So, you know, we talked about Nick Foles' performance against the Giants. All right. The rushing attack. You know, another 108, another 108 yards, over 100, four yards per carry. Let me ask you real quick with the rushing attack. Yeah. Are you still okay with the split, or do you need to see JHI getting more work as we get closer to the playoffs? I'll stay with this, and I don't know, you know, how much more work. I mean, the guy touched the ball 16 times, yeah. if I'm right. I, I think so. I think it was 14 or 16. I know he had 12 carries. Well, no, he, I'm I, not sure how many catches he had. He had, he had four, I thought he had 14 carries. Did he only have 12? I believe it was twelve. Either way, I mean, if you're you're in that area of fourteen to sixteen, either way. Well, I just want to find out how many uh, catches he had. Okay. I'm curious to know. That's what I'm curious to know about him right now. Let's go back a little bit here. Where are the birds? Like I, I'm starting to feel like they went out and they traded for this guy for a reason, and, and I think the reason becomes more magnified now with. Carson being out of the lineup. 14 touches. Okay, it was 14 touches. I need to see him 20 touches. I think they win with him getting 20 touches. See, I, he's just so explosive. No, he is. but I And I think he's even more explosive in the role he's being used in right now. One, he stays fresher game in, game out, right? Mm-hmm. So you keep them explosive plays happening. This is where I think we're like a guy like – with, you know, and I love Charles, and he's a running back guy, and he's an Ajayi guy, but I think this is where he's missing missing the bigger picture. Okay. And I think this is where a lot of the fan base is missing the bigger picture. Like, you, you have three backs. So if I can keep guys fresher game in and game out, again, not Madden, and I can keep him fresher, and now, now you look at two catches, 40 yards, right, with explosive uh, play of 32, Okay, mm. and you look an explosive run of twenty two, but four point one yards a carry. It's right where you want it to be. And now defense is now at the game plan, not only for Jay Ajayi and Legarrette Blount and Corey Clement. And I just think it makes it harder on an entire defense a game plan because different guys do different things. And I, and I, I think that just I think that matters. But I don't disagree with you. Fifteen touches a game for Jay Ajayi is perfect, 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 perfect. Now, if you want to talk game one. In the playoffs, you want to talk 20 touches? Yep, because now it's do or die well, that, or, and go well, that, home time. Right, and that was, but I think it's keeping them fresh right now okay, and that was, for that go was, time. And that was the question, and I apologize if I didn't word it that no, way. No, but, no. It was, but it was like, you know, as we're, as we're you know, you're getting Thank into you. that. Thank you for not wording it like that because it brought me into there. Well, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Bell, semi's fucking smart for a minute, so well, what's no, wrong I mean, with it? Well, that's because when it comes to running backs, you are smart. But anyway. Smarter than Charles. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm going to get him every time. I I'm going to get him every time. I don't know. He's going to go back and listen, so I hope you heard that one. He's, he's going to 3-6 you in a minute. He, uh, Sean Spielman, Eli Manning did that to the Eagles defense. He had no offensive coordinator, and, yeah, he carved them. Yeah, we talked about it, showing that he pretty much was the offensive coordinator. Yeah, you're you're an hour late, Sean. Vinny Masson, way more gun in the NFL, like you guys are saying. It is. Uh, and Vinny Mass says, agree with Tom, playoffs for Ajayi. That's when I want to see 20. Right, but so that and that's where I'm going is, if he's at 12 last week, do you need to have him at? Oh, I'm saying touches. Well, and that's fine. It doesn't even necessarily have to be carries. But if he's at if he's at 12 12 carries 
and two catches last week. So if he's at 14, do you need to build him up to 18 to 20 this week, back him down a little bit against Dallas, make sure that there's you know no problems, so that that first playoff game, whenever that may, may be and against whomever it may be, that if you need to put the ball in his gut 20, 22, 23 times, he's ready for it. Well, how about this? And answer this question. Why, why do younger running backs have more success right out the gate? Fresher, it, fresher legs. Yeah, fresher legs. So, you know, I look at Ajayi like, no, I don't think he needs to get up to that, like to, to feel that kind of game impact because he's done it in Miami. Right. I mean, he was their cowbell last year. He had plenty, tons of carries. <laughs> So more cowbell. Yeah, more cow. I love when you do that. I don't even know what the hell it's bell with. cow. Bell cow cowbell. He runs with a bell. <laughs> he does run with a, a heavy bell. bell. So I got a fever. Fever think, for the cowbell. And that's where it goes back to. Uh, <laughs> but I think that he's built for that, so it's not something you have to like build him up for. So I think playoff time is a perfect time for him to get them 20, 22 touches. But even then, depending on how the game's playing out, you might need Legarrett in for more for more carries and more situations. So, and Charles Peele said, sorry I'm an hour late, missed whatever said about Eli, was what can Brown do for you all night? Got home, tuned in. Yeah, that heavy workload. Heavy workload. We feel you, brother, this time of year. And Daniel Baker. We actually get let Sean know that we gave Eli and that Tons offense of a lot of love. Because he was the offense coordinator, essentially, Sunday. They did a great job getting the ball out of his hands, and, and Eli showed some resemblance of who he used to be. And I think Sean's saying that can we – you know, I think he said earlier, can we just – can he just sign with Jacksonville already? <laughs> like, a time to go. You know, and that's what you need him to do. So, maybe you can trade him, Sean. Uh, Flyers win 4-3. Nice. Get right back on their winning ways after the uh, the loss to the Kings the other night. So, officially two points out of that last playoff spot. How did, and I heard Hacksaw nice. getting, like, you know, that him in, uh, you know, with the media today and them hitting him with that one. I'm like, wow, how did – how the tides have changed or shifted or whatever the hell it's called. Funny, right? right now, it's like we're talking playoffs. Like we're Playoffs? We're, we're there. Like it was just so funny. We're running out of town. There's a week and a half ago. It's funny, Maybe though. Maybe yeah. It's gone. I, I, whenever Bad that, coach. Like, yeah. yeah, whenever that whole thing comes up, though, I like I, it's ridiculous because I, I – Sorry, Darius yelled, yo. Yo, Darius. Yo. Packers League. Yo. Word. Sorry. No, I mean, whenever, whenever that whole topic comes up, I, just, I go back to Brian Atard sitting here on the couch with us saying, would you rather have the Flyers go in as an eight seed or would you rather have them suck and get another high draft pick? And I still say the same thing. Playoffs. 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 Especially in hockey because yes, an eight exactly. seed can ride a hot goalie and one hot stick I think all the way to the sport, Stanley Cup Finals. I think for any sport where you have young talent, you want to taste the experience of either playoff football, playoff hockey, playoff basketball, playoff baseball, whatever it may be. I think you want that for a young team. Uh, Bob Hartman, or Ryan Broder goes, hey, guys, if the Eagles lose to the Raiders on Monday, how far will your confidence level for this team fall? It's a good question. Honestly, for me. I haven't even thought about it because them losing – it's just not even a consideration for me. It's not in for me either, but it, it won't it won't fall that much because I just you know they are what their record is, and this would be a twelve and three football team with every opportunity to go beat Dallas on New Year's and, and get and still get what you set out to do for the season. And you have one goal. Well, to, you know, I mean, you got to break yeah. it down like they break it down, right? You got to break it down in coach speak. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can answer this question is to break it down in coach speak for a second. Okay, you, you set out for the season what? Number one goal is to win our division, right? Done. Done. Number two goal, get a first round bye. Yep. Done. Check. Number three goal, everything comes through South Philly. That's the next check mark. Any way you get that done to me is not a is, is my confidence won't won't fall. Now, talk to me if you lose two straight where my confidence level is. You gotta check the check marks, right? Then the next check mark is winning that first home playoff game. Mm -hmm. So it's building blocks. So to me, it won't if they just split they got to go one-on-one -on -one here. That's well, all. And here's the thing for me. So there's a lot of factors in play here. If, if Minnesota loses on Saturday night and Monday basically becomes meaningless and they're shuffling guys in and out and Foles only plays the first half or whatever and they wind up dropping the game because it didn't mean anything, I could care less. If the game is still meaningful 
and they lose, but they played well, and Oakland just basically comes out and goes ape shit on both sides of the ball because they're trying to save Jack Del Rio's job, and it's a good, hard-fought, entertaining game, and they just come out on the, the short end of it, it is what it is. If they come out and they just completely shit the bed, yeah, then there's a level of concern. But to your point, as long as the check marks are still there, you know, I'm okay waiting another week to, to put the next check mark up as long as the pay, paper is uh, or the pen's still touching the paper. Exactly. And I, and I think, you know, it depends. Like you said, it depends how they lose. And I think, you know, Ryan and Bob both said the same thing. You know, it depends on how they lose. Um, to me, it's not it, – I, I don't like, – again, I'm going to coach speak it, man. Right. You, you set out for goals. As long as everything's got to come through South's goddamn Philly, I don't give a shit how we get there. I don't care if we lose to the Raiders and beat the Cowboys. I don't care. I'm a big believer, and I actually want to play for something in Week 17 because I'm not a believer in all that time off. Right. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. And I'm telling you guys, if, we're, if we have two freaking weeks off, don't, uh, don't be surprised if it is a one and done. I, I don't like that. It's not, success, it's not a successful recipe. It, you see it. The teams that have to play are the teams that usually do good things. Atlanta didn't have Week 17 off last year nope. in the NFC. They had to play for something still. Now they got the first round by different story. Okay, I'm okay with the one by. I almost say like, you know, I still play my players in the first half. Right. If week 17 doesn't matter, just because I want them to still play, keep the momentum up. Yeah. So and I want them to play and not have two weeks officially off. Now play them a quarter. Okay, two, whatever. Right. Do like a preseason game. You know, play them two, get them out. I, I think a lot of that, you know, matters. And I think guys. You know, everybody like wants to look at like week seventeen. Like, well, we don't want everybody to play. You know, we want we wanted to just you know we want everybody to rest. No, no, not all, no, not, not really. All. Because that, look back, like there's you know when you want to talk analytics, it doesn't play well. And I understand what people are saying, but it doesn't play well. He's, uh, he had another random Eagles question, Ryan. Who's the top five currently active play? The top five, I guess, current active players on the Eagles. Who would be your top five, I guess? Mm. I guess, like, top five players? El- top elaborate five a little more on that. Like, Who's the top five currently active players on the Eagles? I mean, are we just, like, ranking our number one to... One to five, I guess. And, and does currently active mean you can't have Wentz or Peters or Sproles or... That's how I would read it. Yeah, that's how I'm reading it, too. What do you got on YouTube, and then we'll answer it. We'll, we'll get into that one. Uh, TTP wants to go some Sixers talk. He was we talking about uh, uh, some stats he wants to throw out there. Rocco shooting 7 of 32 from 3 and 12 of 45 from the field uh, in the last three games and has nine turnovers. Don't get me wrong, Rocco's my man, but we need more from our starting small forward than that to win games. And I think he's pressing a little bit. I think it's been a tough month for Rocco. He had some personal issues came back, was actually playing decent, and then had that that fall that he took in Minnesota where apparently a very sharp edge of a seat went into his back, missed a couple games, hasn't really been the same since. I'm not in panic mode over this team yet. So, And, that, and that's indi- guys individually and team collectively. Bear, we'll get into it in a minute. Yeah. He's saying uh, guys that are injured don't count. So Wentz doesn't count. So top five guys. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I think you can look right at your Pro Bowl. I mean, I think you, yeah. I mean, I think you got to go. You go Fletcher, Fletcher. I mean, for me, it's Fletcher, Ertz, Lane, Malcolm, and Brooks. And Brooks, yeah. And then you can. And then and then kind of fill in the blanks from there. I mean, I Kel- think- Kelsey's probably six. You know, Nigel like, Seven. I think Alshon's in the conversation. Alshon's, Alshon's, Alshon's in the conversation. top ten. It's yeah. tough because you got guys playing different positions. Yeah, it's like it's, it's almost tough. it's, it's tough. almost like like what's the criteria, you know? Yeah, like it's tough. Like if you told me like, okay, top five, you know, give me top two on the defense. So I'll say, okay, Fletch and I'm not even gonna go Malcolm. I'm gonna go Brandon Graham. And that's fine. So I'll say Fletch and Brandon Graham. That's you, a snub. So what, a Pro Bowl snub? Pro Bowl yep, snub, Brandon yep. Graham, Just yeah. The name never gets him in. It's bullshit. Yep. Um offense, who are my who are my top two linemen? Well, one's Lane, two's Brandon Brooks. Right. Okay, who are my 
who are my top two wideouts? Uh, one's Alshon, yeah, two's Nelson. Nelson. Yeah. You know, who are my who are my playmakers? Well, you can rank them really. It's tough to rank them three: Nelson, Alshon, and Ertz, and Ertz, because they've all done really good. Yeah. So it's a tough question. It really is. Well, I, I, I you put Kelsey. You know, our lines played. Is that a great year? Well, I think I saw the stat. Was it Monday? Maybe that uh, Alshon, Nelson, Kelsey. It's the first team in something like 18 or 20 years to have three receivers with nine touchdowns or more each. Wow. it's a lot of touchdowns. It is a lot of touchdowns. It is a lot of touchdowns. All Nelson does is catch touchdowns now, too. So, Uh, Benning's got – TTP says, if you could add any player in the league to the birds, aside from a quarterback, who would it be? Any player besides a quarterback. I know who I'm adding. Robbie's not going to like it a whole lot, but I know who I'm adding. Oh, don't you do it. I'll take the convict. Who's Zeke? Zeke, absolutely. No, there's nothing wrong with that one. You've never know, found guilty. You, know, a convict. you, you put Zeke in a backfield with Carson Wentz? Forget about it. I go I go other side of the football. I go right to the front, man. I take Aaron Donald. Ain't nothing wrong with that either. I take Aaron oh, Donald, and I, put, and I say, who are you going to double ball. now? Who are you going to double now up front? Because I'm just going to dominate you with the line of scrimmage. That's all. There you that, go. That's my guy. I love freaking Donald. He's so dominant. No, I mean, I, I'll take Z. <laughs> but, but don't get me wrong. I could go A.B. I could go A.B. Oh, I got no problem I got no problem going A.B. I got no problem going uh, uh, Julio. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's fun with with uh, with Carson. That'd be yeah. cute. Uh, Vinny goes, Cox, Ajayi, Ertz, Graham, Jeffrey. Order can be moved. Yeah. Uh, Bob, it's, it's fluid week to week. Cox, Lane, Ertz, Malcolm, Brandon, Graham. TTP says Bobby Wagner. Maybe a little P squared. Kind I agree with Vinny more than I agree with Bob because it, it, because I, I take Malcolm out because of what Jim Schwartz is doing to him. He's not one of my top players in the last three weeks because he's not playing his natural goddamn position. And I know Charles last night, I, I know Charles last night is it, it, saying, well, because of, because of Jordan Hex uh, and because of no uh, Joe Walker. Well, you're hurting two positions for one now. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of talking about this year in and year out. It's ridiculous. He's a Pro Bowl fucking safety, and you need to leave him where he's a Pro Bowl at. It's 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 asinine. And I do watch a shit ton of goddamn tape. And we talked about this for years now. Still and, 22. And I don't even need to watch tape on Sunday to see the guy in the box all day, all day, all damn day. And I'm saying to my dad, why is he in the box? I did a video. I don't even touch social media during the game. I don't touch it. I don't react during games like that. I reacted to that. There was a video out on that. You know what the problem is? You're watching old man. You're watching games with your old man, and you're getting emotional. I am. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Home for the holidays. Supposed to be. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Jeremy Beelan saying, "What's up?" Daddy's so What's cool. up, I think Jeremy? I had another question, Mike. He wanted to. Uh, that couch is calling me. Need to get up there and get got more time now. Come on down. I rubbed it. I rubbed the couch for him. Ryan says, all day. Oh, he said, Bob said, ha, that's why I asked Ryan if oh, I didn't see that. If Jim's playing Malcolm is safety or not. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> I say, me and you are always on the same page. Always on the same page, Bobby. Always. We've been on this Malcolm thing. He was giving Charles heat about it last night. He was, like, pretty much being me. I was like, I didn't even need to get in the chat. And me and Bob, we freaking think everything I like. Like, it's, it's sick. You know how guys like that. Like, me and you think a lot alike. That's why we don't argue about shit. You know, me and Greg, we think a lot alike, but then we see things from different perspectives, so we argue a lot. But, like, you know, some guys where you just, you know, everything you say, it's like, yeah, man, yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. Or, or I'm not, you know, yeah. it, you, you believe sort of the same things. It's funny. But, he's, yeah, he's not a he, – he's just not – he doesn't deserve to be up in the box. But Kelsey was a little bit of a snub. I thought he's had a good year. I, and I'll eat crow on Kelsey because – I was ready to be done with him before the season, and he played so much better this year than I thought he was going to. He really did. He had a chip on his shoulder. Let's take that way that into some Phil stuff. All right. So, obviously, the deal moved Freddie to San Diego. Uh, De Los Santos back. Again, De Los Santos was San Diego's number 13 prospect, and they had the best farm system in the majors. He immediately becomes a top 10 prospect for us, which is good in two ways. Number one, he can be fast-tracked. Number two, he can be flipped. And 
it looks a hell of a lot sexier when you're flipping a guy who is a quote-unquote top 10 prospect to a team like the Orioles. And that's what was holding up the Orioles job from Machado uh, with the White Sox was that pitching. And Baltimore wants a ton of arms back. So when that move got when that move got made for the arm, I said, okay, it looks like it could be where you're saying stockpiling some arms in our in our organization here so we can move some out. Right. Well, let me ask you a question now. I want you to put on your GM cap. Love it. So you're now the GM of the Baltimore Orioles, and you get the news today that Zach Britton off-season training ruptures his Achilles and is out at least six months. So you're down a closer. Now, granted, you could find another guy to be a closer, but does this become your gateway to start your rebuild sooner? And if so, how anxious are you to move Manny to get something for him rather than letting him walk? Man, I'm ang- I, if I'm that, I'm anxious to move Manny right now, <clears throat> even before Breton, just because, you know, you're, he's contract's going to run up. He's not going to sign there. And right now you have the chance to get the most for him that you're ever going to get. Agreed. And he, before the season even starts. Like, he's not going to do more than he's done this, to make his value higher. Like, his value is about as high as it's ever going to get. And that's just facts. You know what I mean? I mean, mean here's the thing. He's a 24-year-old like, freaking kid who's a freaking stud. Oh, so no, his well, values. Right. And they talk about guys playing, you know, playing in contract years. But what happens if he comes out this year and he really just doesn't have a good year? Like, he started off slow last year. Yeah. So, I mean. So, I mean, to, to that point, I mean, like, you're exactly right. I, I don't think his value to the Orioles will ever be higher than it is literally right now. No. And if I'm the Phillies, I, I, I load the truck up with poppies. You know, I I break the bank for a guy like that, and I always will. I live and die by that that kind of move for a 24-year-old kid that is a star in this league and a, and a pretend, and you can argue a top-10 player in this league. Easy, easy. And if it's a sign and deal, I pay him whatever the hell he wants. Absolutely. I, I mean, I wouldn't see this as affecting the timeline of when you move Machado. What I think this does is it affects what teams you're going to talk to. In that regard, maybe you're going to talk to teams that have a deep bullpen, like the Yankees, like the uh, Cubs, you know, like some of the other teams with a deep bullpen. That may affect which teams you're talking to. But I think to Tom's point, you're exactly right. Maximize on value now because he's not going to resign. Yeah, and they want an arm before Brett, and that's all they want. They want young arms. You know, I don't even know if they want MLB players, really. You know, I, you know, I think they're looking for for all prospects. And, you know, we got we're, – ah, we're filled with a – a pipeline filled with them. Well, so, I, I t- give them familiar. Well, I, I, I talked about this. You know, I talked about this a little bit last week. Where, you know, I mean, the two big names, actually three, if you want to throw Eshelman in there, but you know, Sixto Sanchez, who, you know, who Jeff mentioned while he was here, Franklin Kilame, and then Tom Eshelman. You know, those would be my my three arms that, in a vacuum, I would say they're untouchable. But if we're talking Machado. I might be willing to part with Kilame. And if Machado is willing to agree to an extension before the trade, then I might jump from Kilame to Sanchez. I don't want to part with him, but if I know that I'm getting Manny and he's signing an extension, that changes things a lot. Well, I'll give yeah, you whatever some, you want. You know, some of the other names that have been tossed out there over the last couple days, Marcus Stroman, and I'm hearing that the interest in, from the Blue Jays is – Herrera, Cesar Hernandez, and potentially, and, and I, I, I don't know why, but Jorge Alfaro. Now, I don't know if I'm giving up three of them for Marcus Stroman or if they don't have any intention of giving up Stroman at all, but the Phillies came back to them and said, if you want those three guys, it's going to cost you Marcus Stroman. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. I, I'll listen. Um, Kansas- How old Stroman? Oh, he's he's young. He's I know 20, he is. Twenty four. And while Robbie's looking at that, that I know, deal. I know the the other the other twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. So the other intriguing one that that caught me the other day was, so Kansas City is looking at possibly losing Hosmer and Mustakis, and if they lose Hosmer and Mustakis, Danny Duffy is still under team control for three more years. So he'd actually. Probably, you know, they'd require some return, you know, because you're getting a contract. It's a very fair contract with three years of control. 
I'd be jumping on Danny Duffy all day. Yeah, I I'd be I love jumping him. on Mike Mustakis too, especially I'd, if I can't get a Manny deal done. There's nothing wrong with that's that. A, that's a name that I love too. I'm a little suspect of Duffy's durability, though. I mean, now it's easy to say coming off of an injury plague year or what have you, but if you look back into it, he's always had trouble staying healthy consistently through seasons. So buyer beware. Okay, that's Fair why point. you know I buy into the Archer and I'll load the truck up for Archer. Well, uh, boy, that's the thing is now if you look at what Tampa did today with Longoria, with Longoria. Do you have to back the truck up for Archer? Yeah, probably still do because he's just, you know, he's that good. Right. You know, um, but that's fine. You, yeah. You're getting, pro- you're getting proven, a proven commodity. Trade all the prospects in the world for proven commodities. I looked at, Listen, I, I'll empty the farm system right now for Machado that's and Archer. Crazy. I empty the goddamn thing. I won't have a triple A team. I won't have a triple A team this year. Oh, we can't do it. Take them. Can't do it. I just got to go sign a bunch of guys. As filthy as Archer has been in the American League, he – Multiply it by 10 in the National League. Man. With that slider, no chance. No chance. And him and Noel at the top of your rotation, oh. you need two. I was telling somebody this the other day, you need, you need two. two right. Every good one has two. You don't need three. You don't need five. Okay? You just need, guys, you need good, solid guys who, who can, who can what, you know, get deeper in the games. You know, pitch a, you know, a good start, six innings, quality start, whatever. You need them guys, three, four, five. Well, but one, two, got to be man. your guys. Stay in Tampa, though, for it real quick. Drop it down a tier. I'm hearing that they may be willing to make Blake Snell available for the right deal. Any interest there? Not not interested. Yeah, and then Alex Cobb is still a free agent, which I, I don't know that there haven't been talks on Alex Cobb, but if I'm the Phillies and he's a free agent, I'm on the phone with them. Because, I mean, this is a guy who, and to Rob's point, you know, health issues with Danny Duffy, Alex Cobb, health issues, inconsistent, but a real, real good young arm that you may be able to get on the cheap. Yeah, it's not. It's worth a shot. It is. It is. You want to get in the Sixers? I mean, if, you, well, if, you're, if you're willing to take shots on, on Charlie Morton and Clay Buckholtz, Alex Cobb should be a no-brainer. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, let, let's go Sixers. And hopefully we're, you know, the Carlos Santana signing is the shift that – it's almost like the Sixers shift, right? Well, where like where like the Reddick signing told you like, okay, we're really going to start to try to put together you know a real NBA team, and and I think the same thing goes for the Phillies. Well, I mean, just keep it in the in the same ballpark, basically. It was it to me. It reminds me a lot of they decided to build the new ballpark and then they went out and signed Jim Tomey. And now, and I'm not putting Carlos Santana in the same category as Jim Tomey, but it's the same effect where. You know, they built a ballpark, they signed Tomey, and then all of a sudden guys wanted to come here. Well, now this is, you know, this, like you said, it, it's, this is the sign that, that, you know, the Phillies are no longer in neutral or reverse. This is, this is where we start putting the car in drive it's a legit and, and building, it, ba- yeah, and building middle, it back in, up. In the middle of your lineup, and you know the way baseball goes. You know, every year, the start of the season, you never, never know how things go. So there's nothing to say that these kids aren't ready to play and this team can't compete for a last wild card. You just don't know, and you got to wait through, you know, what other moves they make. Yeah. But you just never know. So, but they have a. I mean, now they have a. They have a sur- little, surplus of first baseman, a surplus of outfielders. Dude, they have a legit MLB lineup. Yeah, and a lot of arms in their it's system. Dangerous. Yeah. It's young and dangerous. Absolutely, young and dangerous, and that, and that's exciting. In the Sixers, struggle's real, man. The struggle is real. Seven out of eight. Blow a sixteen pointer last oh. night. Set, yep, seven I, out of eight. Honest to God, Tommy, I turned it off. I, I'm, I, they get to a point, they're up 16, and Embiid's not playing, and I'm like, you know what, I'm out. Like, I got stuff that I got to do here. I had to get ready for our show tonight. I'm out. I, I, and I talked to you, and I said, I'll turn it back on when the postgame show comes back on because I just want to get a medical update on JoJo. I figured the game was in the bag. Little did I know. You can't close, you know. It, there's there's a lot of issues like you talk about Rocco is it's been terrible uh you know they're they're not the same team without Embiid that's why I always talked about like you know play the guy you know 10 minutes not you know obviously there's a back issue here but you know back to backs like play him 10 just because just his impact in the game and him just being there means so much but but when is this going to end man like I, I don't get why there's still a hesitation to play him consistently is it still a concern this injury I'm a little well, not no concerned. that is the back Oh, okay. That's so a totally right. different so, issue. Right. So he he got banged up pretty good on Friday night. I mean, he played 50 minutes Friday night. He got banged around pretty good. They had the weekend off. And so they came back, what, Monday at Chicago. 
and they basically said, okay, this is a back-to-back. Let's pull out another lead, too, while we're at it. Yeah, we'll sit him the front end of the back-to-back and then play him the back end of the back-to-back at home. Well, then they find out at 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon that he's not playing. And when they say they found out he wasn't playing, I think that's their decision. Because if you look at him on the bench in street clothes, he's sitting up on the bench like close to the coaches. He's into the game. Like, I, to me, it looked like he wanted to play last night. And everything that I've heard was it was a medical staff decision. It was not a player decision. Uh, I have no issue with that with him not playing if it's not. If you you're know, hurt, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. And, and giving him you can give him a little more time off. You play him Christmas yeah. Day, and everything's fine. Right. You know, and you got to take care of your biggest asset. Right. You know, especially when we talk about a back. You know, the foot the foot thing. Like Rob said, like yeah, when's that going to end? That's right. ridiculous. And in terms of that back to back, but this kind of situation. You know, don't play him. You know, so this is a smart move, then. This is yeah, not being well, over precautious. And it, the, yeah. yeah, and it becomes a – I mean, in my mind, it becomes a thing where, you know, that calendar switches to 2018. The whole mindset has to change. Like, you can go October, November, December trying to get a feel for your team and what you have and where guys need to play and how many minutes and stuff like that. That calendar flips. you got to be ready to go. And, and to me – the best possible situation that they can get themselves into now is to get a couple more wins before the new year and at least be back to 500, if not a, a game better, and, and then hit the ground running in January. I mean, they, they, you know, they have a game early, early on against Boston, but the game's in Europe. And to me, that becomes a bit of the equalizer. So if you're going to beat Boston, that's probably going to be the place to do it. But... They have a stretch in January of some real winnable games, and they need to get it done. Yeah, they do. Deion uh, Brown, Ben Simmons need to take more open shots. Completely agree. Agreed. Bob Hartman need a healthy Fultz. Completely agree Agreed. on that one as well. And, you know, Ben does need to have a little bit more killer in him. A lot more killer. I'm sorry. A lot more aggression. You know, you're big. You're physical. Take over games. Trust the jumper you've worked on for a year. You know, we can talk about it at nauseum. You know, we're at 11, 12 now. I know we want to wrap at 11, 15. But – you know, it's just a lack of aggression, man, and it's just a disappearing act, and I know he's young, and I get that, but when Joel's not on the court, man, you have to take over basketball games. You know, Rocco can't can't shoot his way out of, you know, can't, couldn't shoot a, a beach ball into a goddamn ocean right now. You know, J.J.'s not playing well right now. You know, he's banged up, too. You know, now, now he's banged up. You know, T.J. was banged up. You know, people are criticizing Dario. People are criticizing Brett Brown. It's still a young team. Still a young team. And I think we have to deal with some of the, the learning curves and the, not, the ability to not close out games. Remember, this was a tank for so long. It's hard to flip the switch, man. I've said that for, I've said that for years. It's not just going to be a flick of the switch, even though I had this team win as many games as I did. I still believed. But that was with Joel playing 68-plus basketball games. Such we're great not getting slam- uh, similarities between the Sixers and Flyers. Young squad, high skill level can't finish yeah and and you're absolutely right I think the one difference fundamentally is in the NHL you have to play pretty much your entire team it's just a matter of how many minutes guys are on the ice personally I think as the season wears on Brett needs to shorten his bench a little bit I think that I I think you need to see more minutes for Dario and a lot more Trevor Booker a lot less Amir Johnson and Rashawn Holmes needs to dial back the jumpers I think you need to see less TLC and more Jared Bayless. I mean, there's just – some guys just aren't figuring out their role, and there's only so much coach can do for them. And you're not going to win with guys like TLC taking 12 shots a night. Hell so no, but that's the problem. I'll just leave that there. And that's the problem when your star don't shoot enough either right. or hasn't developed it yet, and we'll give him time because, listen, we love him, and we're going to continue to trust him. And TTP says, I don't understand why Ben was – rolling, shooting five for six, and then he stopped. Yeah. Hey, if I'm Ben, I'm looking at it as, you know what, JoJo's not here. He doesn't have to get his. I'm about to go off. Yeah, I, 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 that's where you're looking for the killer. This is where you have a chance to, to kill. And like you said, you're five for six and you stop shooting. I don't get it. Listen, for another edition of Tom. Mike. I am. In the PM. HDRadio.com. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Your comments, you help drive the show. We love you all. Fly, Eagles, fly. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy Boxing Day. Happy holidays, and <laughs> we'll see you. Festivus the, for the rest of us. Yeah, we'll Thanks, see you. Jeff Singer, for stopping yeah, by. Yeah, thanks, Sing Sing, for stopping by. Thanks, Gibson Mayor LLC, our certified public accountant. Make, Make them yours. yours. GibsonMayor.com, BMW Landing City, Stream Smart Vinny, Sports Outlet Inc., Scandano Sports, 
Love you all. Fly with fly. Merry Christmas. We'll be back next week. Later. Hello again, everyone. This is Bob Mannery, and you're listening to Tom and Mike AM in the PM only on A2D Radio. Tom and Mike, these guys are fucking awesome. But their side piece, Greg, that guy is a goddamn problem. <laughs>